sorry, good evening, <laughs> and welcome to this joint meeting of the Manhattan City Commission and the Manhattan Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. We have, I have no idea how long it's been since these two boards have met. Ron, do you? It's been a while, and so it's time. So uh, this, that, this is a good thing. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to welcome the Parks and Recreation Board members here and say, <laughs> we're glad to see you and uh, I know the you know the community is interested in this conversation we're interested in this conversation and um, so I won't spend much any more time on it but thank you it's important and now I'd like for Jared Wassinger to call the role for this Manhattan City Commission and then he'll call the role for the Manhattan Parks and Recreation Advisory Board thank you Mayor Morris Present. Commissioner Hattisall. <coughs> Commissioner Hattisall. Maybe not yet, but his iPhone is here. Yeah. Is. Commissioner Butler. Present. <coughs> Commissioner Reddy. Present. Commissioner Mata. Here. So we have a quorum. And then I think the, I, I, Adesol's here too. I hey, there we get go. my phone figured out. So <laughs> okay. I'm here. All right, we Thanks. got a quorum. Uh, and then for the Park and Rec Advisory Board, uh, Chair Klemek. Here. Vice Chair Mays. Here. Member Hegemeister. Here. Member Lander. Here. Member Roselle. Here. Member Schaefer. And Member Waxman. Here. And we have a quorum as well. Okay, thank you, Jared. Um, uh, we've done the roll call, so let's do the Pledge of Allegiance now. If you would join me. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. And, <coughs> excuse me, this is a work session. And at work sessions, we don't vote. Uh, but we are here for a discussion. And our topic this evening is uh, for the city commissioners and members of the Parks and Rec Advisory Board to meet together to primarily hold a discussion between, uh, regarding parks and recreation strategies and approaches moving forward. So uh, we have a, a kind of a tentative agenda that uh, Ed and I worked on and with the city manager to uh, uh, did I let's see um, the, at the first part we will have a presentation by city staff for about the first 15 minutes and uh, we uh, <clears throat> and they'll answer questions but we thought it would be important for them we we've had two sessions uh, where we had an uh, a briefing and and it's been two months so we thought we'd like to have an update from that for, during this past period of time then we have some topics for discussion and the status of uh, recreational programming and uh, the loss of staff and then budget issues so those are pretty some of those are pretty weighty topics so um, if uh, uh, Wyatt Thompson, Ron Fear, who's going to? Mayor, did you want to take make the finding about public comment? I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, in order for the city commission to uh, uh, have public comments after a while, uh, we need a motion to approve that. <clears throat> Mayor, I move we have public comment during work session. I second. Second, do we do, do we need to do it for each item on the agenda or just general? Okay. Just, yeah, this will be the only item. Direction the said by items. So. Yeah, at the end, I think. <laughs> Jared, would you call the roll? Are we pretty clear? Yeah. Commissioner Hattisall? Yes. Commissioner Butler? Yes. Commissioner Reddy? Yes. Commissioner Mata? Yes. Mayor Morse? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Okay. Do you need 
to do any administrative housekeeping. <laughs> I don't think they've started that process yet. <clears throat> okay, very so, good. Uh, well, then at this point, uh, whoever from the city yeah, administration. Yeah, I'll, I'll lead off. Uh, please do. Thank you, Mayor. Yep. Good evening, uh, commissioners, board members. Pleasure to meet with you uh, this evening. We've got uh, just kind of a brief update uh, that kind of updates for some of the programming, a short version. The, follow similar to what was on the PowerPoint uh, that was attached to the public agenda as well as uh, uh, I'll cover of, and why it's going to lead off uh, Wyatt Thompson our interim Parks and Rec director so appreciate that and then uh, I'll have a just a brief uh, comment uh, uh, on our strategic plan thank you mm -hmm. thank you Commissioner Addisall, you should be seeing our screen now, although we're not seeing our screen. There we go. I do. You do? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> and we do here as well. Uh, good evening, Commissioners, Park Board members, uh, Wyatt Thompson, Interim Director for Parks and Recreation. Um, very happy to be with you here tonight and, and looking forward to a good discussion about the future of Parks and Recreation. Uh, since our last meeting, our last Park Board meeting, August 1st, and since our uh, public forum on July 18th uh, made a lot of progress on some topics and so looking forward to uh, sharing those with you tonight I think very really very positive news in, uh, in terms of fall programs hiring and then and some of the next steps that we would envision and certainly looking forward to your comments and feedback about how we can uh, do better be better and be the best park and recreation agency that Manhattan has ever ever had so in terms of uh, what we've been able to roll out for the fall, uh, this was very similar uh, to what we presented previously, but a variety of, of adult sports, uh, pickleball, volleyball, a uh, variety of youth sports, uh, flag football, volleyball, tumbling, ninja training, um, as well as today we released a three-on-three -three clinic in partnership with, the, with NBA, which is a youth basketball uh, program. In arts and humanities, well, we're, we're offering uh, monthly art workshops, a variety of dance programs, and parents' night out activities, which are like date night opportunities. Drop your kids off at the rec centers and uh, go out on the town, spend some money, sales tax, and then come pick your kid up. Um, and then in the area of special communities, uh, we are... <laughs> Welcome, Dave. We, we saved you a seat. In the area of, of special communities, uh, we're offering uh, challenger football, uh, bowling, as well as barrier-free theater. So registration on all of these activities has begun, and there's a variety of start dates for these activities. So some uh, sessions are, are filling up or are close to full. Uh, some sessions are, are still needing some more people. Uh, we are promoting um, opportunities through our typical city channels, which is you know Facebook and, and the Insider newsletter, so through email. Uh, we have also uh, partnered with the school district to share this information uh, through the school district channels. And I know uh, yesterday I received an email from uh, my son's principal with information about his school, and at the bottom of that email was our information. And so I'm assuming that's also going out through other other parents through the school district. And we do appreciate that partnership and that opportunity to get our information out about our programs through through the district. I know they reach a lot of people and we're looking forward to continuing uh, working with them to, to help advertise these, these programs and opportunities. In terms of, of hiring, we've made a number of key hires and are working through uh, some additional um, interviews and advertisement as well and so starting uh, really in, in August is when we were able to bring on our first set of folks and so Lauren Lofink is a marketing specialist she's not actually in Parks and Recreation but she supports us uh, through the park through through the city manager's office and the communications division and so she's been able to hit the ground running and produce a lot of the graphics that you've seen for uh, for promoting our our programs and offerings for the fall 
Uh, we've also hired a recreation superintendent, which is a key leadership position within Parks and Recreation, uh, Chris Curtis. He comes to Manhattan with 20 years of experience in the recreation field and has, I think this is his sixth day on the seventh day on the job. You might want to introduce him. I, I do want okay. to introduce yeah. him, yes. So Chris, Chris Curtis, if you want to introduce yourself and tell him a little bit about you. All right, thanks, thanks Wyatt. Yeah, my name is Chris Curtis. As Wyatt said, I have about 20 years of experience uh, in Parks and Recreation. About 14 of those years I spent as Recreation Superintendent in Salina, Dodge City, and here in Manhattan. And most recently, I was park planner, project manager with Shawnee County Parks and Recreation for the last two years. So excited to be back in Manhattan and looking forward to working with all of you and all the citizens of Manhattan. Welcome. We're Thank glad you. to have you. <laughs> so uh, Chris oversees all of our uh, recreation supervisors and coordinators for our recreation facilities, um, athletic fields, uh, aquatics. Um, all of that is in his wheelhouse, and he spent the last week meeting with staff and getting to know programs, revisiting facilities. He's quite familiar with Manhattan, and so he's been able to, to really make a big impact already in his short time and looking forward to the contributions he continues to make for the department. Um, we've, we have several open uh, recreation supervisor positions, and we've, we've hired, made one hire. Uh, we were able to uh, actually pull someone from uh, K-State Rec uh, to come work for us and bring their experience from working in that uh, that environment and come be a supervisor for us. We're very uh, looking forward to that individual starting uh, September 6th, and then we are continuing to review applications. We have a very strong applicant pool uh, for those supervisor positions, and so are, are working through that process to interview those additional candidates, but um, we, we anticipate having multiple qualified candidates for those positions. Uh, we've also hired three recreation coordinators, uh, which you know report to those supervisors and, and help with uh, assisting in program delivery and, and facility management. Uh, two of those individuals have started uh, last Monday and this Monday, and the third one starts uh, the Monday after Labor Day. So all all in all, I mean, really, we're we're starting to rebuild that that team that's able to deliver facilities and programs to the community. Oh, we're also continuing to advertise uh, rec center seasonal support staff. We have a, a actually, we probably have enough people um, in place right now. I think they were just finishing up some some hires and and getting people situated at the Anthony and Eisenhower Rec Center. Uh, we have a custodian that we're trying to fill at the Eisenhower Rec Center. Uh, we're advertising and interviewing for facility seasonals in terms of superv facility supervisors and athletic field maintenance. We also have a couple positions open in parks in a senior administrative assistant, as well as park maintenance seasonals. Those are positions we've been down uh, quite a few for a long time. Uh, we're still trying to recruit into those positions to support our full-time staff in, in park maintenance and the delivery of those facilities. In terms of, of next steps, we. Uh, We've presented uh, these slides once previously, but I, I still think that, that this, this, these strategies are still pertinent and certainly open for your input and feedback tonight. Um, in terms of, of next steps for recreation programs, uh, we suggest evaluating our cost recovery model. Our current model would indicate we recover 110% of all youth programs, uh, special events, special communities programs, senior programs and 120% of direct costs for adult programs. How we define direct costs are really the supplies and equipment and t-shirts and materials needed to run the program and the seasonal staff to run the program. It does not include the administrative overhead costs for uh, Chris's salary, the supervisors, the coordinators, the full-time salaries haven't historically been a part of that model. There's other models for cost recovery out there that other communities utilize. So we suggest evaluating that model, engaging with you all, engaging with the community for what that model would look like and what costs we're recovering, what costs are being subsidized through uh, general tax base, or what other revenue opportunities there may be through sponsorships, donations, um, other sources like that. We would recommend evaluating our current staffing model uh, in terms of our 
Anthony Rec Center and adult sports and Eisenhower Rec Center and youth sports and how those <coughs> are delivered at those centers, as well as our arts and humanities uh, programs and, and positions and just under and, and events. I think that's on a, a later slide, but how we facilitate special events and tournaments. I think the our, our staff that we're hiring will be able to, to fill holes as we need them. And so we want to make sure that we're positioning the organization in the, the division in the best way to deliver those services. And we want to engage the community to prioritize our programming and identify new opportunities. So what kinds of recreation opportunities is the community looking for? Uh, whether that's sports or activities, is it youth, adult, what ages? Uh, what, what kind of opportunities are they looking for and how can we fill those? Uh, we'd look to update our agreements with third party providers. Since COVID, we've developed a number of relationships with third parties who deliver programs uh, either in our facilities or that we pr help promote and deliver and take registration for, and they deliver those programs at their facilities. So formalizing some of that is a, is a good next step in the development of those relationships. And then develop and implement sponsorship strategies. Uh, we've had various strategies in the past to do that. COVID and the years since uh, challenged us in that. We've met internally a couple of times now with staff, with Chris, to develop some more broader strategies that will help us increase those sponsorship contributions that help us ultimately keep fees low as well, but still allow us to you know, offset our costs to deliver the programs. In terms of next step, as next steps at the recreation centers, obviously we'll have some new staff coming on board and so we want to hire and train those staff. Uh, we've already developed uh, in the past month or so, had some in-service training with staff with jointly between the two centers. Uh, that helps build consistency between the centers. It also helps us reinforce some of those basic uh, operating goals in terms of customer service, in terms of how to manage difficult situations. And so just increasing that ability to train and equip our seasonals as well as our full-time staff uh, to do their jobs uh, effectively. Uh, developing those consistent policies and procedures and then enforcing those uh, procedures with, at, at each building. Uh, working with the CVB to schedule tournaments is an ongoing process um, and we appreciate their partnership in helping us identify uh, those tournaments providers and tournaments to come into our community. Uh, we want to continue working with the Boys and Girls Club for uh, implementation of the after school program that launched this week and we've had two days so far that have been implemented successfully uh, with that and so continuing to work with them uh, and promote that opportunity. There are still spots available at both Anthony and Eisenhower uh, so if, if you're looking for after school program opportunities that that is available for uh, for people to sign up for uh, and then also exploring additional revenue opportunities at the centers and just what you know how can we help offset some of the, the operational costs of running those buildings 12 13 14 hours a day uh, for various programs activities and drop-in users In terms of tournaments, events, and facilities, uh, we have some, some positions to hire, and we want to evaluate what that staffing model is for delivery of our athletic fields, and our, as well as our facilities in terms of rentals and supervision, so that it's clear to folks who are wanting to rent our facilities or use our facilities who those points of contact are. Uh, currently, we're working with park staff to, to maintain uh, existing ball fields, prep the sand volleyball courts, uh, they've, they've been able to step in while we work to rehire some of those key staff members on our side. But long term, what's the best spot for those for that field maintenance uh, team to, to be supervised from? Uh, we want to evaluate that staffing model for tournaments and how Twin Oaks and Annenberg Park are managed, as well as as we talk about future improvements to Seco Park and our ability to host bigger or more tournaments is how, how do we staff that facility appropriately so that we can make the best use of those new resources and, and invite more people to participate at those new facilities. Um, as well as evaluating rental fees, again, that, that becomes part of the cost recovery discussion in terms of what we should be charging to rent you know, the shelter, rent a field for a game, rent an entire facility for a tournament or a large event. Um, 
different goals and considerations that we need to work through with you all in the community as we set those fees. Um, also, we need to evaluate our model and for delivering special events. We've been able to deliver a number of special events in the past that, that were of various sizes. And so I think continued discussion about what those events look like, how we could partner potentially with the chamber, with Aggieville, with downtown, with other community partners to host larger events that might attract even more people and have some sort of economic return in terms of visitors to the community or sales tax generation in the business districts are all opportunities that I think we have in front of us. And then work with those partners, the CVB in particular, to increase those facility rentals and attract tournaments um, or facilitate those larger special events. Um, and there could be a whole host of partners that, that we could identify to work with uh, for those kinds of opportunities. Well, that's my overview. I think Ron has one slide he'd like to share and then we'll certainly be open for questions and discussion tonight. Thank you, Wyatt. Thanks, Wyatt. Appreciate that. Uh, just wanted to talk a little bit. Uh, commissioners and certainly members of the board may have been involved with the strategic plan. Certainly the commissioners were all last year and adopted a strategic plan in November of last year. Uh, one of those items was uh, uh, to try and make a, a better strong sense of place for the community as in response to that goal was to kind of develop a comprehensive parks and recreation master plan or its own strategic plan if you will uh, and that's kind of a lot of what was suggested in this action item as many of the things that uh, Wyatt just covered uh, in some of his presentation but the, the down in the middle of that the city should have a holistic evaluation of the different parks and recreation facilities emissions programs uh, activities fees cost recovery models all of that so I mean that's something that uh, we had talked about at the commission's retreat uh, at the beginning of this year and then obviously that's something that we had projected to take place uh, this fall uh, whether we're ramped up to be able to to accomplish that and do that certainly that might be something you all want to discuss i know you've got a, a good list in front of you to do that but uh, i thought uh, that would be something that uh, certainly ties us back to to this goal and that action item to uh, continue to keep a strong sense of place in the community and certainly our Parks and Recreation Department uh, uh, has played and should play a key role in that going forward. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Um, at this point, typically the commissioners have a discussion, but as I think that Ed wants to uh, has some things he'd li a kind of a, a list of things he'd like to talk about and kick off for discussion. So, Ed Klimek, chair of the Parks and Rec Board, and if Mayor, you would take if, it away. If you please, I feel a little awkward talking to everybody sideways, so I'm going to go up and, and okay. address you. Right. And so, I think that's a little better uh, for okay. working. We're good. So, I will walk around <clears throat> here and take care of this. We are flexible. Um, Ed Klimak, Chair of the Park Board, and over the last month, <coughs> six weeks or so, uh, our Park Board has worked probably harder than we have ever have because the public has come forward and expressed a lot of concerns about parks and recreation in our community. And I want to appreciate the fact that uh, city staff now recognizes that we have had a collapse in parks and recreation. And the question is, how did we get here and how are we going to make it improve itself and get to where we need to be? And I, I want to go back. I first got into um, the City Hall uh, back in the 90s and it was when uh, Kent Glasscock got with me and said, Ed, you need to get yourself on that Park and Recreation Board as a first move to get into the City Hall. And the reason for that is Parks and Recreation in Manhattan, Kansas is the envy of the entire state. Best Parks and Rec 
around. He said, get involved in that. You'll learn a lot. You'll get to understand city, uh, city functions as well. Well, luckily, that, that occurred. I got on the park board and then, of course, uh, launched, that launched me into the uh, city commission. And um, so I appreciate the time I spent my first round on the park board. And now, hey, as they say, once you get in the city hall, you never get out. So I'm back on the park board. But one thing um, I, I wanted to uh, speak about tonight is, you know, I, I really feel an obligation to the community that the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board and the City Commission, we need to address the shortcomings of Parks and Recreation. And I appreciate what the staff has uh, laid out to us today. They're making uh, progress on that by recognizing the shortfalls. But we have an obligation. And most of us were there at the community forum uh, last month. Standing room only. Concerned citizens. Coaches, parents, uh, civic leaders, all concerned with where parks and recreation had fallen. And it did, folks. It did. And we heard it firsthand. And so we do have an obligation to make sure that we lift this thing up and that we promote the city staff to get us to where we need to be. I don't feel <laughs> comfortable in having a parks and recreation staff that is subpar. We're not that kind of a town. That's not Manhattan, Kansas. You know, one of the things uh, uh, that's been discussed is uh, we have an obligation in order to attract a workforce to Manhattan for Scorpion and Ed Bath, that we have to have a great parks and recreation staff or uh, uh, parks and recreation department. So we have programming facilities to accommodate those people moving into our town. And that's very, very true. Obviously, that's a quality of life issue and we'll attract people because of it. But you know what more concerns me? Is the people that call Manhattan home. We deserve better. We deserve to have our young people, our seniors, all the community having a quality parks and recreation department. That's our challenge here tonight. And I would hope that we, in a work session, can carry this through and make improvements happen with the uh, support of city staff, which I think we'll have once we give them that direction. I think they'll carry that out for us. But you have a list there of agenda work items. I would like to look at all those tonight and go through those, get comments from you all, and possibly comments from the community as well. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna break up that order a little bit because one of the things that concerned me most was programming and the deficiencies in our programming. And Wyatt did give us some, uh, some ideas for the future, and I'm really glad to see that. But our programming has suffered over the last five, six, seven years. We've dropped many programs. Our participation levels are decreasing rapidly. And why is all that? You know, why, why do we have decreasing participation? Are we not doing what we need to do to get our community involved in programming? And I know, Sue, uh, we got a programming list from the city, and I appreciate that. I think Wyatt gave that to us. And you did kind of an analysis on that, and that might be a good starting point. Do you, re do you recall uh, what you uh, found on that? And I'm going to sit down because I don't want to lead this oh, meeting. Only a second. Okay. You can stay. Um, and you know, it's unfair to totally go through the list and say how many were cut because right. there are many other uh, things were given over to privatization to soccer. But there were 28 programs over the years that have either zero or not applicable anymore. So that surprised me. If you look at the participation, it wasn't just slightly down. We have almost 50% less participation than we did five years ago. That's pretty huge in my mind. Now we don't count the soccer kids anymore because they're over in private. But you know, there's many factors in there. And 
I think that just, I've only been on the Parks and Rec Board for three plus years. That slipped by me that some of these programs weren't being offered. Now, COVID was in there and some of these are bounding back, but um, it, it was a, it's a great piece that Wyatt and staff put together because it did present for me the picture of where we're at and where we can bound back to. Yeah. I think that's the, that's the goal. So we have hit rock bottom in a lot of our programming. So how do we get back? Or do we want to get back? Do we want to get back to those levels? I think if Manhattan, Kansas is our hometown, we need to get it back. We need to have those products, services, facilities. We built a lot of new facilities, but we've had a problem managing those facilities. There's another problem. How do we get that corrected? And we need to talk that out and get the direction to the city staff to make sure it's corrected. So I'm going to sit down, and Mayor, we can start that discussion. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Ed. Um, I think the first item is uh, the viability, the uh, reestablishing or reviving the Parks and Recreation uh, uh, Board uh, that the city has. And you know that there are five members of, uh, that are appointed by the city and uh, two that are appointed by the school board that make up the Parks and Recreation Board. So they come together from <clears throat> diverse backgrounds. Um, I would like to introduce a brand new Parks and Recreation Board member, and that is Nick Landers down at the end. And he is uh, uh, um, very active coaching and um, uh, w with his children and I wanted <clears throat> this is not to criticize but I wanted to make an appointment to the uh, Parks and Rec Board with for someone with children that were active in these programs rather because we're kind of uh, getting a little older here <laughs> our children are growing up and uh, so that's a key point I think so at any rate, so Nick is, this is Nick's first meeting actually as the park board member. So <clears throat> welcome to you. And uh, um, so um, I know that there's been talk about what the bylaws are for the Parks and Rec Board. And so others, uh, Ron, maybe you uh, uh, or somebody on the board could speak to what the actual role of the Parks and Recreation Board is, uh, the mission, I guess, or your, your charge. <laughs> so I was just talking to Wyatt. I think actually at the last uh, Park and Rec Advisory Board meeting, the board had uh, at least some discussion and review, and I think Wyatt had a slide on it. But uh, I think it would be good for the city commission. They haven't heard that, I think. Yeah, I'll comment while you're waiting for Wyatt. I mean, the couple things that we noted in the Parks and Rec Board was that it had a, a statement about looking at facilities and new facilities and new programming, but it had no role for continuation of programs, uh, evaluations, strategic planning for uh, as a role for the board. And uh, that's our uh, hopeful intent to uh, add some of those phrases to that. Uh, I know other advisory boards are being updated too and it's definitely time for us. It's, uh -huh. I think it was 25 year old. Yeah. Um, so the park, how, uh, the question is how are we updating them? Is the board updating them? Uh, some of the other boards have done it themselves um, and edited or whatever. So I, uh, anyway, Wyatt, you're obviously ready. Well, yeah. So these are the these are from the an article from the the bylaws establishing the Park and Recreation Advisory Board, and it, you know this paragraph describes the board's purpose, uh, which is to review you know new construction or major you know, major proposals, uh, reconstruction of of facilities, um, acquisition of parklands, acquisition of major recreational equipment and facilities and institution of new programs in the recreational system um, to make reports to the governing body on matters referred to it 
and such further recommendations as they deem advisable. So if the board wanted to share something with the commission, they would have that opportunity to do so. And then to receive and act on matters that are referred to the park board by other boards. And it specifically calls out the cemetery board, but there's a number of, of boards that have dealt with, with topics in the past that have crossed or overlapped with park and recreation, historic resources, Douglas Center, arts and humanities are some examples. So that's where it sits today. There is a, pr a process uh, later that's described about how to amend these bylaws and it, it does require city commission involvement and action to do so. Um, and obviously, you know, advisory boards are a topic that, that internally and with the commission we've been, we've been trying to address over to, you know, holistically. Um, so what that looks like, we're happy to hear feedback on that. So you've been systematically working your way through the bylaws for all of the advisory boards and you're going to bring them to the city commission as a group? Is that what, I mean, I, 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 I hear boards talking about them, but I've never seen one yet. So I, I think uh, it, it's more specific boards have talked about specific aspects of theirs. So the, the planning board just kind of looked at uh, some of their makeup, but uh, the commission set yourselves a goal for this year to review yeah. the boards and that we talked about at the last briefing session yeah. that we would begin that process so really I think uh, I don't think the staff or the boards themselves have taken on any specific direction and that's kind of what we hope to have come out of uh, I think we've scheduled a meeting in in September uh, to start that process at the commission level uh, at a work session and then proceed from there if there's some direction you want to give the boards for some kind of uh, formal review or input process. Okay. Thank I, you. I think the initial, and I don't know if you had a chance to read the, the memo that we got last week, I think Jared prepared it for the staff and it outlines, you know, a plan for all the boards, which I think was well done. Mm -hmm. It was. Uh, I'm just anxious to get moving. We've been talking about these for, I think, a lot of the time, the time that I've been a commissioner. And so I don't want the, the, this year to, you know, to end. I want us to move on. So I, I, I want to push. You should. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I think uh, looking at the uh, boards and their purpose and all of that should be, you know, like Ron said, we're going to discuss it. And there are some things I agree with and some things mm -hmm. we definitely need to modify. So I don't want to piecemeal each one uh, as we look at this board but as I look at the entire agenda that's in front of us and what Ron said about a strategic plan I I feel each of us has a small view of the big picture uh, the puzzle pieces it might be in our best interest as a community to invest in some kind of uh, professionals to pull all of that together who have an experience in this type of area in Parks and Rec area. Parks and Rec is not my expertise. I don't have all the data and I don't know how to analyze the data that's out there accurately because some things may be outdated, some sports. Pickleball is new these days. Uh, disc golf is new these days and some things may have replaced others. So I don't have a perspective in uh, cultural changes in recreation. And I think that it's important to have those, to see why some of them were not having a good enrollment or why some of them have disappeared and what new ones were brought on. So as we look through all of this, I don't feel, uh, like I said, uh, having uh, the strength to discuss each of these individually. I don't know what a participation level looks like uh, to gauge what normal is. Uh, so I think for sponsorships, if there's communities that are doing it better, I think we need to have some, pull in some other people uh, that are professionals in this area to help guide us um, and all of these other bullet points that are here. As far as the purpose of the Parks and Rec Advisory Board, I think that is something we can discuss tonight and also have another discussion in September. Since this is a work session, we can probably put some ideas in there together and get a general idea. So when September comes around, I don't think it would be fair where some there might be an imbalance of responsibilities uh, from one advisory board to another, but it also needs to be um, uh, representative and relevant to that board. Uh, what might be relevant to one board will not be relevant to the other. So we'll see how much it takes. And also there are volunteers, so I would hate uh, to put 
a ton of extra work for each of these boards um, and understand that they need to be voting on some of these and giving us recommendations too. Uh, so that's a, a lot that's been on my mind as I was looking through all of these things. Okay, I um, am interested in uh, dealing with the bylaws. Uh, I, we don't have to do it tonight, but I want the, the board to finish their work and make a recommendation like the other boards have to the city commission. Seems like that's the procedure. I don't know how to resolve some of the um, purpose of the board. Uh, so we, we just need to deal, you know, maybe uh, it's changed in 25 years. And so other members, Carla? Yeah, I think that, you know, those bylaws look okay. I would just add, you know, one thing to it. I mean, my impression from uh, talking to members of the of the Parks and Rec Board is they just feel like they're not being able to give any direction, that what they get is just briefings from the staff on things, and, and that's on such a high level. It's like, okay, if we're going to build a new field or when we had the tax initiative, sure, the board's involved in that, but nobody went to the board and said, hey, we're going to start a Boys and Girls Club program. I don't think the board got to put any any recommendations in that. I don't think anybody went to the board and said, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna chop this uh, flag football," and so I think that's got to be in there. You know, just just like when you try to do a zoning thing, it's got to go through the board of zoning appeals. Well, maybe major changes to programs, parks and rec board ought to be able to check off on it. That, that that's a pretty simple thing to change. The rest of that I think is solid. But 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 if I'm right, Ed, that's that's the that's the feeling I get that that it's like you've got a board that really can't affect anything. And maybe just to add on to that, because Ed, when you were talking about the deterioration of, of uh, programs and the staff, uh, I mean, this, these bylaws kind of talk about a lot of the future stuff versus what was just ongoing. It would seem to me that the board, and I'm asking the board, would want some briefings like, you know, here are the programs are coming in, here's the ones that are dropped. You know, seeing that on an ongoing basis versus just doing doing a review every once in a while and seeing all this stuff happened, as well as what the commission has asked for for a number of departments, which is like is a little dashboard, like here's what we expected to happen this month. We would bring in this much revenue and had this much participation, and we either got it or we didn't get it. We're running behind. We're running ahead. Uh, so you can really, you know, as a board, see where it's at and not get a phone call with some surprises about a program or that type of thing so is that where you want to go yeah you know I think we're we're talking about this key word uh, out there in government these days transparency and uh, we certainly lack transparency from uh, uh, parks and recreation department for the park and rec uh, advisory board and the public and we saw that in our community forum uh, people weren't aware of things that were happening or coming down or the fact that the leagues that we offered weren't run properly. Uh, there were a lot of uh, issues. Coaches stepped up, told us about that. Um, so <coughs> should we be more transparent with what we do in Parks and Recreation and utilize the Parks and Rec uh, Advisory Board uh, to uh, make some, uh, some of those directions or at least approve things and know what's going on. I think that's probably what we need to do. Um, I'd like, um, um, Carla, you tried to t say something about three, three speakers ago, so I'd like to invite you <laughs> into this conversation. My initial comment was I, I think that it is the charge of the city commission to adopt the bylaws and to adjust the bylaws because we are at your charge. We are appointed by you, we, and you are the elected officials. You are the ones accountable to the public. Um, so I think if there is a change to the bylaws, I think that it starts there. Um, it, it, and also, you are the, the body that sees the bylaws for all of the boards. And when we're talking about consistency, I don't think that one board should have greater authority than a different board. I, I think that that could fall into it if we're each writing our own charge and our own rules about what power we have or don't have. I think that for consistency's sake, it should be um, coming from the direction of the city commission with some input from us. I, I certainly don't want to shirk that responsibility. Um, and at the same time, listening to this conversation, I do still want to be clear 
I think we need to be clear, um, again, the question of authority and the question of governance in the sense of the Parks and Rec Board does not evaluate staff. We do not evaluate city staff. We do, perhaps it, we need to be evaluating programming. Maybe that's a question that needs to come into that conversation. But um, I, I feel like we need to be cautious of, again, balancing the level of authority and responsibility in having citizen involvement, which I think is really important, but also being clear um, where responsibility and accountability lays. For maybe that's the best way I can say it. And yeah. Mayor, I'll contribute to that. I feel like the advising part is us advising from the community to the city commission. You know, that that's yes. the part that we're advising, mm -hmm. and we get caught up in who who we're listening to. Um, a lot of the reporting that we've gotten over the last two to three years has been city staff reporting, um, but we're not evaluating city staff, as you said. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be able to comment from the public, but as when Butler just said, we haven't known of some of the major issues that have come out in the last few months. So it's hard to advise mm -hmm. when we're learning when right along the with the public. Yeah. I think uh, the board has, uh, has to make recommendations or forward uh, to the city commission uh, when you have uh, 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 find there's an issue or a, a motion of support that this is a good idea we support that um, one of my uh, things I wa I I have wa been to many <laughs> Parks and Rec board meetings I watch them on TV because I uh, was one of the boards I started with uh, paying a lot of attention to and there are hardly any motions you just come and you're briefed and then you go home but you don't vote you don't make a motion you don't you know really uh, take action and the city uh, recommendations to the city commission is what really what an advisory board does I think so you know it's just and I uh, there, there are shades of that also it's not any just one thing um, but uh, uh, Christine I was just gonna say so my takeaway from that is just that all of the boards really not just the Parks and Rec Advisory Board but we all just need um, direction as far as what the Commission wants and expects from the Advisory Board and then you all can make the recommendation on the the um, oh goodness not the policy but the um, the bylaws uh -huh. and then uh -huh. then that and I think it help, helps clarify what our role is and, and as you stated that's I mean we do hear from the public yep. quite a bit and so that's a key piece I think we also represent that voice mm -hmm. to to you as the Commission so um, I guess that's and I really do expect the correct? advisory board to make a recommendation to us about the bylaws Every uh, the other boards are all doing that, and so uh, it, it, it it's part of the process. Uh, so anyway, it's carry on, I guess, with that. Um, are we ready for the next item? It, who wants to lead that? It's about the uh, forming or establishing a foundation. Is that who wants to talk about that? Yeah, I think you know we had we had talked with uh, the Greater Manhattan Community Foundation about doing that, and it. It'd be something similar, you know, the Discovery Center's got a foundation, the zoo's got a foundation, so why can't we do that with uh, <clears throat> Parks and Rec? Now the details of it, I don't know, we, you know, we have to sit down with Vern and the group there and, and work that out, but uh, uh, that, that's one way to, you know, help with funding. I mean, you know, the two problems seem to be first staff, which I think there's a process in place now to, to get new staff in there, which is, which is excellent. But the, the next part is, okay, what do we do with the funding? And then that goes along with the fees, too, you know, the recovery plan and stuff. But I think we, we should be able to, in, in my mind, one of the goals the commission should set is to have that foundation in place by the middle of next year. I think, I think like you said, it, it's, it's going to be in the details because I don't, um, the Flint Hills Discovery Center is also part of Parks and Recreation. Uh, so is the Sunset Zoo. Uh, so what does it mean when you, uh, and that's what, I don't know if you can be done in one year or not. If somebody donates money, first of all, I don't know how much is necessary to start it. 
Uh, and second of all, when people donate, is um, does it go to a program? Does it go to a specific uh, area in the Parks and Rec Department? For example, pools or uh, trails, uh, programs, um, rec centers. So that all of that needs to be worked out. And when people donate money, um, how how is it managed to within each of those? Because then each of the uh, if someone donates thinking, I'm going to help out flight football. So how do we know it just goes to flight football? I, it, those are the things that need to be worked out. I don't know how much, how the foundation works in this grand sense. I do know kind of a little bit about the Flint Hills Discovery Center and Sunset Zoo and some of these other entities that have a, a different type of foundation on their own, but not under, uh, in addition to the Greater Manhattan Community Foundation. I think the Jeez. advisory board has been work, uh, discussing a foundation piece for some months now. And there are different models. The Friends of Sunset Zoo is totally diff a different model than the Flint Hills uh, Discovery Center. And I think the administration has to be involved in that. And I'd, I'd really like the advisory board to be a part of that. If they haven't, if you haven't had that kind of joint discussion yet, it, it makes sense that, uh, Sue, you? Mm -hmm. I think there needs to be a careful balance between not just taking things off the tax, you know, the, the city's responsibility. You know, if the, if the city generally puts together softball and football and these things, um, we don't want to just suddenly say, well, now the foundation will pay for all those things. So it has to be a balance between what are we expecting from our city dollars in Parks and Rec and what kind of goes above to the next level that enhances that we would not find in the city budget that would definitely Im improve our community in the recreation and the parks. So it has to be a balance. Mm -hmm. We don't want to suddenly throw everything off and say, oh, well, mm -hmm. let's go ask the foundation to pay for those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think yet we have to carve out a place for the foundation because we have a discussion going on about um, general participation versus club sports. I mean, there are different aspects of it that need to be worked out, and I would expect the city administration to work with the advisory board to get there, um, or, you know, or else dissolve the advisory board because you're not able to function. You're not fulfilling that advisory role. So yeah. I'm an advocate for you being involved. Well, the, the foundation, to be clear, has to be a separate entity from the city. Absolutely. It has its own board. Uh, it is not under the city at all. And uh, that's the way the other, uh, the Sunset Zoo and the Discovery Center is set up. Uh, and one thing is also very clear across the country, people are more willing to give to a foundation and they know exactly where their money is going versus giving to a city or a government entity and they don't know where that money goes. Where does it end up? It goes into the general fund? Does it go where I intended it to do? People are hesitant to give to a government entity but they will to a foundation because they know that money will be directed exactly where it should be going. Yeah, I agree with that, and a lot of uh, communities are going to this foundation model, and there's oftentimes people say, well, how did this city do that, or why do they have this facility? And usually there's some company name on the door, or there's some foundation behind it that got that to happen. And I think there's lots of models we can look at, but I think what's key is what Wynn said. We have to say we want to do it, and set a deadline and make it an accountability that says we expect this to happen by X date. If it doesn't happen, then that's a failure. But we need we need to not debate, set it and go. Yeah, and I, I agree with that and what everybody said about the details, but let's not let the details stop us making the decision we're gonna have a foundation. That's step one. You just gotta say again we're gonna have it. We can work out all the little bells and whistles later with the with the Greater Manhattan Community Foundation and with the advisory boards. But the problem is if you try to build the entire ship right now, you'll never get the keel laid. So decision one's got to be let's have a foundation. So, sorry, I was going to say, so who does that? I mean, 
is the do you need a steering committee? Does the advisory board do that? Do you have key members doing it? If you, we can't I think we need a recommendation board. from the advisory board to the city commission because we're talking about a foundation specific to Parks and Rec and uh, and then the city uh, and the city commission would discuss it and with uh, from the city administration. We don't we individuals don't know enough. It takes a, a legal uh, uh, I think it needs to be an accountability of city staff. If we set it as a priority, give it to them as a goal and a date for it. They're the ones who are the professionals. They're the ones with the resources. There's the ones we look to to do these, and we move forward. Ron? So just a, just a comment. I mean, uh -huh, please. Uh, Chair Klimak made a pretty profound statement. Most foundations happen on their own. Uh, yes. the, matter yes. of fact, We've there, there's two that. types. We went through this with the Discovery Center. Are you going to have a foundation that is affiliated with the city government and is a arm of the city government, or is it, and, and which the model you just suggested would be so, or is it something that needs to, we just would like to encourage the development of a foundation to support it, and that's got to come up on its own. Uh, that it's something so there's two different models so the there. zoo is an example of an independent one they are well and so is the discovery Center. yeah they we, we made it we had that and debate they, and there was yeah. a group of citizens who decided that they'd accept that goal if you will for them to form generic and mandating it then it's truly affiliated with the government it's not a separate independent foundation yeah. okay and the advisory board has discussed that and came, I thought, came to that conclusion already. And that, uh, to have results, uh, will depend on a few, and maybe more than a few, motivated citizens who think there's a big need for it, and they would probably be uh, ones that would start with some a significant contribution and then you get organized because you're going to have a separate foundation board because foundations can be wonderful and I support and give money to several but you have to have trust in that foundation and the board that uh, if you're going to give the money like I think uh, Ed has mentioned here to a certain part of that that it's going to be used in that way and not misused and uh, Again, you have to have somebody, uh, and more than one probably, uh, that's motivated, motivated enough from the citizen group to uh, get it started. And we've talked about it, and we, I thought we kind of came to that conclusion. Okay, but you need a, to make a recommendation to the city commission? Have you done that part yet? I, I don't think they. I have seen it. Yeah, I don't yeah. think they make a recommendation. It has to come from them. Otherwise, it, it becomes a city it, entity. It's a continuing, yeah. continuing item on our agenda, and we discuss. Okay. But we, uh -huh. we don't have authority to do anything either. Mm -hmm. You with make that. A, yeah, well, or you make recommendations to the city commission to do to take action. No. But that's what what we're saying is that if looking at those two models one model is attached to the city yeah it, it would be connected to city government could be. could be and that in all honesty is probably not the model that we've really been discussing that's not the model that the discovery center has that the zoo has or that we were looking at we were looking at a model that is independent of the Parks and Rec Board, it's independent of the city government. And so it's not, to, to me, it's not to us to make a recommendation to the city because what are you gonna do? What we're saying is that we need a group of motivated citizens in our community to say, we find this to be of importance and of value and we want to create a, a foundation. It's independent of both of our entities well that's a in the same way from the advisory board to form an independent foundation no because so, who are no, we recommending yeah. who are we the city so, can't you guys as city commissioners can't tell the citizens to form a you don't have that charge either i don't so what i hear you saying think any of Carla, us are expert that, enough when you when citizens formulate form the um organization for the foundation uh, I get that part of it, and mm -hmm. I get how the you don't make a recommendation for the city because then it comes under the authority of the city. I get mm -hmm. that part of it. So 
when those conversations happen, as all of you have indicated I've had those, have those been done at your advisory board or do you need to have them separately? Because if you have it as an advisory board, then that becomes part of city government, doesn't it? We have had those discussions at our advisory board meetings. So when you- But the next that. question is, do I as an individual citizen then have a charge or a responsibility to be part of that steering and yeah, I and I don't know that that is incumbent upon any of us as I, individuals I we think aren't we aren't talking about individuals yeah we're talking that's about what you were asking that's what me, I was asking about. that's what she was asking so my question is then I think and that's why it's not as easy as we need to give the city staff a charge and get it done because it has to happen organically outside of this building yes and and it is not upon you so unless there's a group for example the aquatic center they form they're doing something so if there's that initiative then that needs to be done differently unless we are saying the city wants to be a part of it and then those conversations right. happen in this and then room. the second part of my comment in that regards is that I think the next piece of that conversation that has to happen is City Commission, Parks and Rec Advisory Board, and staff have to come to a conclusion of what are core, essential Parks and Rec responsibilities and activities that are the essentials and that stay under the umbrella, like Sue was saying, of these are provided by, by our governance and what are the bonus additional things that are nice but not essential things or things that are supplementary however you want to describe it that are funded by the foundation because I think what we're hearing is that we can't necessarily rely upon a foundation for basic operating costs and no, we I think certainly can't do that anytime soon too. well I think this leads into uh, topic 2d is is that's where that piece comes in what is the city staff responsibility about and so that's I think Ed you wanted to talk about you know running it versus there are people who know how know about foundations and we would can sit here and wonder all night but we need expertise and that's bigger than we are probably so city administration and attorneys and yeah we're not going to put foundation. that together this evening all we need to do is have the support yeah. that a foundation concept is a, a correct way to go and get the citizens involved in that and let them take the charge. It is That's a, really it, it's a piece of, uh, because not, neither of these foundations we've talked about tonight are the whole solution. They're supplemental. They buy the extra things that the usual city budget can't afford. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I see it similar, you know, Ed, you were involved in that, you and me and, and, and Commissioner Dodson when he was here and a number of people in the community, you know, we put that Johnny Cobb Plaza out there and, and, and all we had was city support for doing it. Not one tax dollar went into that thing, and people donated to it. And so, you know, I don't see a problem with members of the Parks and Rec Board or the City Commission getting with the, with the Greater Manhattan Community Foundation and setting this thing up. Just that simple. You did that with the Flag Plaza, I think, too, many years ago. So we've got examples of that happening. You know, they're the same with the band shell and all those kind of things. It's not that hard. What, what's, what the problem is, let's put the keel in place first. Worry, worry about the rest of the ship later. I, I was just thinking those happened on their own outside of this room. The Johnny Cost things happen outside of the room. So, that's, so it's not a recommendation you bring to us or we have to approve anything. When I think we aren't going to solve foundation tonight and we've spent a half hour. Yeah. So I'd like to move on to uh, sponsorships. Uh, foundation is a piece of the puzzle. We're also talking about city funding uh, recreation programs. So, but so anyway, let's move on to sponsorships. And I hate to s take that off the, t the discussion table, but we need to move on. Yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah. So sponsorships. Who yeah. is going to lead that discussion? Let me just uh, open. I think we've missed a golden opportunity uh, in the sponsorship world. Many uh, parks and recreation cities across the country sell sponsorships for their programs, their facilities. We have been very, very uh, lax in that. And uh, we, we need to take that opportunity. There's a, look at the K-State Athletic Department. They sell sponsorships for everything. 
Now, we're not quite to that level. We're not going to have 50,000 people there at the football stadium. But still, it's a community uh, entity, and people will step up and buy those sponsorships. So we've got to get a sponsorship program in place that's easy to work with, that doesn't have a lot of red tape in it, that uh, discourages people from stepping up and helping us with sponsorships. Okay. Is there a discussion? I just had a quick question. Yeah. Do we have like a form on the city website where people can, where businesses can sign up or ask to be a sponsor? Is that a possibility? We have a, Ron, but don't we have something, some kind of a policy? It might be minimal, might not be as comprehensive as you're, we're talking about tonight. I'm going to let Wyatt talk a little bit about it. So one of the things that we have done is that we try to use a unique approach for obtaining sponsorships for different things. So and that speaks to some of the process and different aspects like that. But there's other opportunities for different types of sponsorships, uh, whether that be advertising, whether it be underwriting. Uh, those are different types of components. So I'll let Wyatt talk a little bit about it. So yes, with the city, we do have a sponsorship policy that guides staff and how we seek out sponsorships so that we're fair and equitable and who we're requesting participate with us. We do have information on our website about sponsorships. It's under the contact us tab and there's a sponsorship link there. Uh, is that the best place for it? Maybe not. Uh, those are conversations we can, we can have uh, internally, but uh, we do have that information available on the website where people, if they're seeking us out, they could, could use that as a contact. Uh, historically, it's been the responsibility of our recreation supervisors and to some extent the superintendent to pursue those sponsorships. And in years past, we have had uh, you know, varying success at garnering sponsorships for various sports teams, for Arts in the Park. Um, and so, you know, this, this year was not as robust as in previous years, and that's, that is uh, what it is. And so we'll, but we're mo mo moving forward. I think, you know, we've, as I mentioned in my remarks, we've already met internally a couple of times to develop strategies for how to move that forward uh, for 2023 and trying to get information out to businesses in Q4 so that as they're developing their 2023 budgets, they'll have our letter in hand where we're requesting their participation at varying levels with the various recognition opportunities. It's very, uh, it, we're, we're just starting those conversations, so we don't have a, you know, documents or anything to, to share with you at, yet, uh, but I would anticipate that, that we would have something here this fall to share with you all and the community. Have you had, um, do you have now or in the past have goals um, individually and or departmentally for how many sponsorships you're going after? Because moving, moving forward, I would say that we need those goals. I, I couldn't speak accurately how we've handled that over the past several years in terms of a, a quota or a goal for every supervisor. I mean, every supervisor knew their, the cost of their programs and I think there was a general sense of, you know, we were going to try to underwrite the cost of, of T-shirts or hats or, um, you know, wh whether those were written down as part of our performance metrics or not in the past, uh, I'm not certain. Yeah, I just think as you're developing this, you know, obviously that provides the accountability, sets some goals and gets some <clears throat> hoopla uh, around it, you know, um, sponsorships for arts in the parks, and you can just tear that up from the low, lower levels up to the top. To, uh, get some goals to go after. Commissioner, I might, I might uh, just enlighten everyone on our Parks and Rec agenda for the last year and a half has been sponsorships. And we had the golden opportunity with the new rec centers. We had over a year, year and a half to put together some quality sponsorships for those facilities to help us with the operational costs. And I don't think we did anything on those sponsorships with those uh, indoor rec centers. Couldn't get any mileage on that from staff. So we need to put some kind of a, a program together. And I think Chris ought to be quite aware, coming from Salina, they're, they're probably one of the best at getting sponsorships inside their uh, field house. Um, 
actually visited your facility there in Salina before we uh, put together our uh, rec centers here. And there were ideas there. They have their own um, support staff that does uh, sponsorships even outside, I think, of the uh, city. But it's very successful. Would you agree? Yes, I would. And I actually, coming from Shawnee County, they had a very active sponsorship program as well. In fact, they, they uh, contracted with an individual to go out and seek out sponsorships for the department, and they're very, very uh, successful. So, yeah, we're working on some of that, and, yeah, I've got some experience with that, so I'll definitely put that into practice. Thank you. Carla, you had wanted no longer? Okay. Well, let's um, move on to possible community uh, partnerships. And Parks and Rec runs the program but works with other community partners such as the Senior Center, the Flint Hills Volunteer Center, 383, uh, or other ideas, the Boys and Girls Club, marketing. So <clears throat> as you... Uh, uh, are there other potential partners that we ought to have on the list that you can think of? I was thinking about uh, UFM, and I, I don't, uh, I think they have a long history of offering programs. I know at the one time the university dropped all of their gymnastics and swimming and said that's not our job and turned it over to UFM. And uh, that doesn't mean that that's still uh, their charge and that they're, you know, it's not as full and robust as it once was, maybe, but certainly they should be added to the list. Yeah, I wanted to mention, I, you know, I mentioned the Senior Center. I know when I listened to the public comments, there was a couple of individuals that said Parks and Rec had cut, you know, programs for the seniors. And I'm on the Senior Center board, and, of course, they do exercise programs down there and various trips and things like that. And so it makes sense to me not to duplicate those efforts but you know, publicize them in Parks and Rec, and like some one of the things that we cut out was uh, they used to take uh, groups to uh, you know football games in Kansas City and trips like that, and that sort of fell off the the list. The senior center could do that, but they'd need like city support with a bus, and so there's ways to partner there where it's not going to be as intense as it was before. But but I think that that link up you know needs to be made, and and the same with. Uh, Flint Hills Volunteer Center, we, we said we needed extra people to maybe staff the rec centers, take care of some of the problems, and I know the Volunteer Center provides help to the Discovery Center. They've, they've got direct connection there, and they send people over there to help. And so if we could draft a list of extra people requirements that we need and send it over to them, they might be able to fill some of them. You know, not all of them, but I don't think those are the kind of connections we're talking about which would eliminate duplication of effort and in the long run save money and maybe drive up uh, participation in a lot of these programs. Yeah, another one could be Job Corps, um, Flint Hills Job Corps, because they, they'll get their groups together in an event. They'll, you know, help police things and parking and that, or if you just have a cleanup job or something like that. And also some specialty stuff they can even construct uh, if you need. Uh, but in talking to them, they're, frankly, they're looking for opportunities to do stuff like that. They've been active in the community for a lot of years. Um, is, did anyone else? Uh, what about 383? Are we maximizing our relationship? Um, and I, I know we have these gyms side by side. I don't know how we're cooperating. I know we have an agreement about use of space. But that's one kind of cooperating, but as far as co uh, actually cooperating. Okay, Christine. Sorry. Before we get to the, the Boys and Girls Club piece of it, um, it has USD 383, the intramural sports for 6th to ninth grade. I mean, I don't know. I personally don't know how the district handles intramurals, but that might be an opportunity for some growth there <coughs> with the Parks and Rec. But um, I do have a little bit of... I gathered some information on are we ready to move on to the boys and girls club piece or where were you going with well that i'd there? like to if there are other suggestions of other entities yeah i wanted to the intramural thing you know really sounds like a great opportunity to me because we had a lot of people that said you know hey there's not enough uh, sports events for kids at certain ages now if the schools got an intramural program and we can partner with parks and rec and use our facilities and maybe some of our staff to 
expand that so that they're doing part of it and we're doing part of it, uh, I think there's a great opportunity there. Uh, what about, are there other ideas for partnerships or cooperation between USD 383 and uh, the city? Um, I'm not going to promise that this is absolutely accurate, but moving sixth grade to middle school has changed that dynamic somewhat. Um, I think that there are lots of opportunities for our seventh and eighth graders to participate in sports. Um, and there's a lot of, I would say at middle school level especially, um, every effort is made for those teams to be as big as they possibly can so that students who have not been introduced to a particular activity have the opportunity to, to do it. Um, I want to say that sixth grade has not been able to participate in sports with them moving over. And the issue with that, if I recall correctly, is insurance and busing conversations. Um, that at that at the age of that population, there are different rules around that as far as being able to travel for athletics. I'm not 100% on that, but I'm pretty certain that that is the distinction for why our sixth graders are not necessarily able to participate in school-based um, athletic activities. Now, I will say that, that our schools are engaged very consistently with after-school activities and clubs of a number of varieties, whether it's um, just different social clubs. Each of the schools, um, AMS and EMS, both have student-run interest clubs that are then organized by the group and have an adult sponsor and, and have those activities go on. And those activities are accessible to our sixth graders. Um, I felt like when we were talking about, um, when we were at the listening session at the fire station and the feedback that we were hearing um, was not necessarily uh, geared towards not having opportunities for the older group, the middle school to high school group during the school year, but perhaps during the summer. So thinking more along the lines of summer activities, um, softball, baseball, and those sorts of sports activities because those, the, the, the older crowd, it's, it's club ball and it's, there's not the park and rec connection to it. And I don't know that the school district would have an active role or engagement because of it being summer programming. But I think during the school year, there's, a, there's an abundance of after school activities. And I would also say out of that, um, we're asking our teachers and school staff to do a lot, a lot. And we might uh, and benefit, yeah. we might benefit from Chris's experience in these other Kansas communities also about That's, their cooperation with their district. Right, and yeah. the partnership with other, you know, the volunteers and, and like you said with Chris, but we should brought up a great point, um, especially for that seventh and eighth. And there, I mean, there are opportunities, but they're limited. You can only have five kids on a basketball court. You can only have 11, you know, so you've got your, five starters and then a few backups and then you've got practice players but there are other kids you know that want to play but maybe just don't make the cut and so having just that intramural experience available I mean you could kind of see what interest you get but other things like ultimate frisbee I know that's kind of a, a big one and they have that at the high school but um, you know there's other things but it was I, I do think there are other kids that want to be active that maybe don't have that opportunity for that age group. I think we have talked, several of us on the City Commission, about making sure that the recreation programs include local children and not just the children that can, whose parents can afford the higher costs of club sports. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, no, we don't have hockey, thankfully, <laughs> because that's high dollar <laughs> to participate. But I, I think we have a long history of of ordinary kids, and that's what uh, I want to be sure we don't leave that behind. Sue, you wanted to say something? I would like to see us go back and look at what was it like 10 years ago? I mean, what did we have in the way of youth softball, um, regular pitch ball? My, talking about the opportunity to play, 
my daughter played in her, her seventh and eighth grade, but once she hit high school, you know, those teams go down to, you know, the, the ten, 10 best. So, yeah. But she continued volleyball through Parks and Rec for four more years, and now she still plays volleyball. My son played basketball and still plays pickup basketball, but he wasn't mm -hmm. a good jumper. He wasn't that athletic. Phil probably is laughing back there because he knew my son. But, um, you know, he needed that Parks and Rec program. I'd love to see what we look like. 10 years ago, and I know times have changed. They're not the same kids, they're not the same video stuff out there, but what was it, and what would the public help us by coming forward and, and helping engage us in what should return or what really is passe and kids don't want? I don't know, I just know what it was like for my two kids, and they valued it. I just had a couple of thoughts. Cornhole, that would be, you know what, that's a really popular thing. Um, you know, even Foursquare. I mean, you know, just things where they can be active outside. Mm -hmm. But we all have to admit, we have to have staff to do that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it, great in theory to see what the school district wants to do. Or volunteers our teachers from the are community. doing more than they're asked. So part of it is saying, yes, we need those rec leagues for the, for the foundation of the young students five years old to 12 years old, when they're in those elementary school years that they can try out mm -hmm. basketball, volleyball, mm -hmm. softball, baseball, the different sports that then when they get into the middle school, hopefully they can get into the, the, the sport of the school and get on those teams. And, then, and if they decide during those elementary school years that they want to go play traveling ball, there are sponsorships out there for, for those teams. I think we're missing the big picture that we're losing that foundation. And it is changed. I mean, Sue, it's not like even my kids are 25 years old. It's never gonna be that way. There's, there's a lot of, of, of cities across this state that things have changed because there's different, there's multiple opportunities. But if we don't have a foundation for our average kids, we're, we're, gonna, lo we're gonna lose it. Um, yeah. I, I just want to piggyback on the, the conversation around how important staff is. They, these things don't operate strictly on volunteers. They cannot operate strictly on volunteers. And when I think back to um, my life as a younger parent, when my kids were at the age where they were participating in these activities, um, one of the big challenges for me as a parent was when you were signing your kid up for a parks and rec activity, you didn't know when practice was gonna be. You didn't know when games were gonna be. You didn't have any of that kind of information accessible to you. And um, I was not a single parent, but I had to plan as if I was. And many of our families are single parents and are trying to get kids from multiple activities. and. That, to me, was driven by the fact that our coaches were volunteers, that, that that is how those schedules were put together out of necessity. I understand that. But I think that's one of those self-fulfilling prophecies of does your participation go down? Because at this point, with as many uh, two working families, kids going in lots of different directions, whether we're talking about the fact that all of our kids are overscheduled and participating in too many things, whatever that might be, the ability for us to make concrete plans depends on the stability of the programming that we're looking at. And so those things don't happen when we are relying upon a volunteer force to, to sufficiently, stably, reliably provide those services. And to me, that comes down to having a staff level that is sufficient to, to meet the basic requirements of the activities that we're talking about. And that has, that's the thread that comes through all of this. When Wyatt was giving the, the briefing earlier and we're talking about the staff that we've hired, and I don't know this, but my question in my mind was, these aren't new positions. These are positions that perhaps have turned over recently or were vacant for some time. Um, and so those things weren't happening. So filling our staffing issue can help, but we're almost having to rebuild. And I think that's it's what no we're talking about. no almost to it. 
Okay. <laughs> but I think that fundamentally, we have to know, and the city staff has to know, that the support will be there for them to effectively be able to do their job. We cannot expect them to do the work of 10 people or, tw or 20 people without giving them the resources they need to do it. And we can't say we expect you to do it on the back of volunteers. Volunteers are wonderful and they are needed across every, every organization that you talk to. Okay. But how do we do that as budget and, and, and as Jason yeah. Hilgers presented a couple weeks ago, since 2017, those monies have been yep. non-existent. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've talked about this a good long time also, uh, and I, uh, I know uh, who would want to speak to the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, is, uh, Ron, I know Christine wants to speak to it, but does somebody need to tee is it up? Hannah here? Did Hannah come? Hannah, yay. Hannah is the uh, director of Boys and Girls Club, and she could probably speak much better to the arrangement going on and sort of the facility use and how all of that has to play out and what role we each play in that. Oops. Do I need to sign in? No. 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 Okay. This is a work session. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, no I'm minutes. Hannah Coash. No minutes. <laughs> yes. I'm Hannah Coash. I am the new CEO there at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, I've been there for six weeks, I think, now. Um, so Wyatt approached us um, to partner um, and expand our current programming. Um, we have been offering after-school programming at AMS and EMS since, um, I believe, we were licensed in 2006 at those sites. Um, so we have had smaller programs um, there at those two schools and have offered um, our general programs that focus on academic success, healthy lifestyles, and good character and citizenship programs. Um, when Wyatt approached us, um, we of course want to expand um, the amount of kids that we can service in the community and if there is a need and we are able to help fill that then um, we will do so. Um, so in the meantime we <laughs> got our lives together and got some staff hired and um, have been implementing programs like Wyatt said we've been open now two days um, we have had um, a good amount of members there at EMS we had 43 kids there today and at AMS we had 33 so um, our numbers are higher than what we had been having um, in previous years we do still have slots available we're currently licensed for 50 we are in the process of increasing those licenses so that we can have closer to 150 or 200 kids um, and by then we would be able to up our staffing levels to support that amount of kids um, for us the priority is making sure that we're offering safe and fun engaging programs for the teens um, teenagers are a different beast um, and so they need some different types of programming than what we offer for elementary school students um, so we'll continue to assess our programs and what we can offer them. Does that help? <laughs> I don't know if perhaps you and or Wyatt could talk about the, the space usage with regard to the rec center and boys and girls club. Maybe you guys could shed some light on how that works. Sure. So uh, we're continuing our relationship with the school district as well as the new partnership with boys and girls club. And so during the school day and after the school day up until 530, the school district has priority for courts three and four, which are the courts that are directly connected to the school. And in that after school time, the school district uses those courts for practices, for their athletic activities, for some games, um, as well as some other, you know, other school type related uh, active after school activities. The Boys and Girls Club has access to courts one and two, and the multi-purpose classroom and that in the lobby space um, on the pub, what we call the public side of the gym. And so they are still utilizing their existing classroom space at AMS and EMS, uh, where the students, and correct me if I'm wrong, Hannah, but the students are checking in um, in the classroom. And then as a group, they're with staff led, they're walking over to the rec centers uh, and having their activities in our in our space and then as kids are checked out or parents come for pickup those students are released back uh, for pickup currently 
at, at the school side. I believe as they pursue licensure of, of the rec center facilities for that expanded programming for more participation, uh, we may look to be able to have, you know, check out processes at our side rather than sending kids back through the school. But those are those are ongoing conversations. But um, so the, the facility is being fully used between those two programs um, in that after school time frame, all, all the courts. So 50 students per facility is the maximum capacity, capacity? based based on Boys and Girls Club's current licensure for their program, yes, with the intent to increase that uh, in the future. Okay, but just a pure space standpoint, because we've gotten a couple emails of, you know, why can't the public still come? Isn't there enough space? Obviously, people think there is. Obviously, there is if we can increase the program and add more people. So if we increased it, we probably couldn't let people in. But that's the question. Yeah, I think there's there's enough physical capacity for for more participation, and obviously we've had we had higher numbers than that on certain days last year during our our drop in after school period, and you know tournaments and events have more more people than fifty. I think the our challenge came just from administering both the Boys and Girls Club program for their staff to administer the program, and if you mix public, especially other youth into that space where three where on courts one and two because courts three and four are closed off for the school district we didn't think that it would be a, a feasible opportunity to co-mingle club participants and non-club participants in the same spaces and i i don't know if if you could speak to kdhe licensure if there's any requirements to mix not mix public with students or yes not. the general rule would be to not be mixing the public and um, boys and girls club usage for a licensed after school program so just a, a couple questions as you've said that so this the school side is now being used after school by the school and that's a change from last year right because no. when the school day ended last year the entire complex I spoke with one of the principals at uh, one of the middle schools, and it probably is the same. Um, Mr. Martinez said that currently their volleyball practice is in the gym. They're not using the rec center. Um, when they have games, they're using their own gym, but the matches, if they have matches and quads, that that would use the rec space. They do plan on increasing the use of that rec space towards mid-October when basketball would start. So that's sort of what the district piece is right now for usage of that. And that's so also that was, that's also until 5:30. I believe so. Or yeah, yeah. whenever. Or, I mean, within a, within a few minutes. Yeah. Right. That's when yeah. the Boys and Girls Club period ends. It's 5:30. 5:30. Mm -hmm. You see, the question I got from a couple of emails was the the fact that you know the school isn't really using three and four continually every single day. So is it possible? to have Boys and Girls Club use three and four on the days the school isn't, and then opening the other side to the public. Now that's not gonna leave it open all the time, but it would it would change it a little bit. You know, like if the school is gonna use it, you know, three days a week, then, uh, you know, for two days a week, Boys and Girls Club would use the school side and we could open up, you know, the, the parks and rec side for the public. I don't and, know how you would schedule that in a way that the community would be able to track it because it's going to be dependent upon meets and matches and I mean it's, well, yeah. it's not going to be Monday Wednesday Friday I know it, it would fluctuate of, but it's on the website now the hours are there I I, I was just you know relaying that because I got several emails sure. concerned about that there's several think people it's so that much about the games and those things those those are scheduled and have already been given to the rec staff and boys and girls club I think the, the issue that may be is the conflict is just the consistency for Boys and Girls Club um, and utilizing the space that they have contracted to use and so I think the conflict is that the public can't use it during that time mm -hmm. that's the conflict yeah and I think they get frustrated when they see it empty right. but I can't use it and the challenge is well can't you figure it out so when it's empty mm -hmm. we can use it I mean, I, that's what it comes down to the licensure piece of it well, I think we, well and does it also come back to having staffing levels at the rec centers themselves that are able to 
the right manage time. the the day to day, right? And aren't trying to do ten other things at the same time. It, I, that's that's part of it. Is I think we could have a higher expectation of the staff that are physically planted at those buildings if they weren't also trying to do a bunch of other stuff. Can I quick question for Hannah? Um, clarity in my brain. When you're talking about the 50 kids that you're serving right now, are those the, the same 50 kids that you would have been serving in spots last year? Or is it like you have your traditional programming and then an additional 50 kids? Does that make sense? Um, the full license right now is for 50 for both, and that's what it's been licensed at. We were not having 50 um, at Participated either. Participated either location. Yeah, so, either you're op too. so it's the same programming, same license, but expanding into being able to use the recreation space. Yes. Okay. Correct. And just two quick questions. Mm -hmm. now, I'm, now I'm off. <laughs> Wait a minute. Now I'm on. Uh, type of activities that you have from the 2:30 or 3 o'clock start time to 5:30 are. Yeah. So we offer programming in academic success. So we offer homework, tutoring, help, that kind of thing. Um, healthy lifestyles. So. Obviously with the rec center, um, it does help us expand some of that healthy lifestyle programming so that they are able to utilize gym space a little bit more. We were not using gyms um, on the school district side, so that is um, very beneficial to our kids that are attending. Um, and then we offer good character and citizenship programs. So um, them so, getting out in the community, doing different service projects, learning about how to serve their community. and become commissioners so the gym, <laughs> gym is a part of it but it's not a sign is it half of the time or oh timing wise yeah. um we are circulating kids through the gym the whole time so uh -huh. they're doing homework and then they're moving into gym activities and okay. kids are switching back and forth the other question mm -hmm. i think you charge in my granddaughter who's now past that and a sophomore in college but <laughs> was in a program years ago uh, you charge a hundred dollars for the kids. It's a hundred dollars per semester. A hundred dollars per semester. Do you pay any fee to the uh, to the um, uh, rec Parks and Rec Department? No, we do not pay a fee okay. to the Parks and Rec. I think we need to send the press release to all of the members of the Parks and Rec Board in case they haven't seen it. I mean, we've, we've seen you that. got it. Okay, good. All right, thank you. So, Linda, I just wanted to yeah, add please, a, you uh, comment to this. I think. Um, the school district has a really good relationship with Boys and Girls Club. I know they did an outstanding job when they were at Ogden about homework and getting them uh, through other activities. My major concern, and I was, um, I had accepted the Boys and Girls partnership uh, for the rec centers mainly because to keep our um, rec centers uh, functioning decently without vandalism or any kind of other bullying or all kinds of other stuff happening with 100 kids in there all at once. This was kind of a, a solution, a temporary solution. Once they get licensed for 100 students and have more staff and be able to manage that, that would be ideal. And maybe even having uh, other teachers. I know they're already extended, but having paid staff. The thing with our staff is you also, it's not just, uh, you can't just have a bunch of students and a bunch of staff staff has to understand adolescence like you just said they're just a whole different group of people right. you can't just have adult bodies there that's not enough just to have a hundred adult bodies for a hundred students it won't work that way mm -hmm. so I think that's that requires a different type of training and if that's something we want to um, invest in then we need to do that but rec centers are different than just having a program for soccer and having somebody as uh, tr being trained to be a scorekeeper or a coach, but they also, in, when they're in after school clubs, adolescents, um, you really need to be careful because there could be lots of liability issues, even if they're on school property and principals and parents may be in charge of that. Um, I didn't get positive feedback from them being there. And I think this was a temporary solution to the problem and maybe we can work towards better solutions. Uh, so I think this isn't permanent, but certainly it's a work that we need to continue to talk about. And staff that's going to be there needs to be trained in management of students and adolescents. Yeah. And the vandalism that was experienced is directly related to lack of staffing, I think, or and training maybe. 
Well, I spent some time at both those rec centers last year when you know, I, I used the term mayhem, w which is what it was. And, and uh, you know, I went this year also right after school started before this program kicked in Thursday, Friday. There were a little bit less kids there initially, but I saw the same thing. There were, there were a couple fights that staff broke up and kids run around screaming and I'm deaf in one ear and it gave me a headache you know, in there, and, and I don't think I'd be prepared to handle those kids because my temper would uh, get away with me, you know, because just the way they were behaving. And they weren't there to play basketball. Some of them were. There were some kids out there who did a good workout, but the majority of them were just sitting around the tables with uh, computers, cell phones, watching the TV, and just, you know, socializing and things of that nature. So, and I talked to the staff, and... Uh, they were doing their best to, con to control it, and there were a couple of extra ones uh, in there. Some of the pool staff, because the pools had closed, you know, were there. And, and I asked their opinion, and, and basically, now these are the, the, the people actually working the counters, not anybody in management. And they basically said to control that mob of kids that was coming in there, between three and five, you'd have to reinforce each one of the rec centers with five more staff that were trained, just to cover it, because the problem is, you know, they were doing little TikTok videos and trashing the restrooms because that was entertaining. You, you could do that on social media. So you'd actually have to have somebody, you know, patrol the restrooms. Uh, last year, I think we had to lock them. That's what happened. They had to lock them. They had to lock the elevators because they were trashing the elevators. And so that's why you would need five people. They'd, you'd have to have one up on the, on the walking track and two of them on the, you know, the basketball court and one in the common use area. And, and I figured out the cost. I, I, maybe you could hire college kids to do that, but at $15 an hour, we'd be kicking up the budget between $90,000 and $100,000 a year to make that happen. And so that, that's the attractiveness of the Boys and Girls Club uh, solution. And I understand the frustration. You know, people are saying, well, you know, the public can't use it between three and five. Well, my experience last year was, and, I, and my wife and a number of the, my friends play pickleball, and <coughs> some of them liked Anthony. But they punched out of there at 3.30 because they couldn't handle it with those kids in there. They're older guys like me, you know, so they can't, can't function in that kind of an environment. So they just left. So, you know, personally, you know, I see the problem, but it's only for a couple of hours. And, and it, it is, you know, you've got to balance it. So I think right now this is the best solution for right now. Long term, you know, if you can get the licensing up and we can get, you know, 100 or more kids in there, that's even better. You know, because it's structured. The downside that that people have sent me is, okay, you got to pay $100. I think you have to pay 30 to join Boys and Girls Club. So, you know, it's $100 a semester and then 30 to join. Does that stress any families? But I think there are some scholarship opportunities. Yeah, if I can speak to that. Um, we do offer scholarships. Parents can apply. Um, we often scholarship the whole thing for families or put people on payment plans. Um, we don't turn away people due to an inability to play. Yeah, and I don't know, you know, uh, if the city could look into subsidizing that some way. In other words, when I think about having to hire additional staff for $100,000, would we be better off to say, why don't we just add about 40000 into scholarships? And, and that's still a good partnership with Boys and Girls Club, but that's just brainstorming uh, options because, uh, you know, it, it, it is difficult to, to solve this particular problem because I don't think anybody anticipated, you know, that becoming a after-school daycare center when the centers were built. We thought, yeah, kids would drop in there and play basketball, but if you physically go there and look at it, you'll see that's not what was happening. We need, we need to move I'm, on. Just make just, one I, comment here. I think our future challenge here with the middle school rec centers is we have to protect the ability for the public to use those facilities. So this is where we're at today. We're not going to change it. But let's remember that these were built for the public. And to reduce the, uh, the operational time for the public to be there uh, is not where we, that was not our challenge when we built these. And it wasn't what we sold the public. Uh, and they voted to, to fund these. So. We've got to be recognizing of that fact. And if something else comes up and somebody needs to shut that, uh, the courts off to the public, we better look at that and scrutinize that request very closely. 
especially for 50 students. I mean, 50 students. Anyway, the next item is marketing. Is there any, uh, what can? Um, I, I sent one thing. I, I know the staff has it and Wyatt has it. it. It was based on something I observed down in Bentonville, talking to their parks and rec people. They all had uh, various advertising signs at the ball games, you know, along the fences. And, and what they were doing was they had a standard design. You know, they, they had a rectangular, you know, sign you could put on the baseball field fence. And the way they set it up was it was it was a printed by a company in, in a town. It was on mesh so that wind would blow through it. So you don't have these things flapping around, which is essential in Kansas. And the way they set it up was the, the Parks and Rec just designated, like you could take Twin Oaks, for example, and say, okay, we got slots for 30 of these. Go down to one of the sign companies in town and say, we got 30 slots. Here's the memorandum of understanding or contract. You sell the advertising, you hang up the sign, and you give the city X amount of money for each one that you sell. And so you're not going to have a whole lot of staff time on that. You're going to let private company run it all. The only staff time would be, okay, how many slots and locations do we want to put these? And you could start it slow by going, you know, start with Twin Oaks, and then later, you know, maybe add Griffith Park, other facilities, and eventually Seco when it gets rebuilt. And uh, that might be a source of revenue, which will help us solve some other things. But, but the best way to do it is, I think there's three sign companies in town, see if one of them will bite on it. It'd be just like selling a billboard spot or something like that for them. And then add a caveat in there, of course, you want to have a tasteful advertising. Certain things probably would not be appropriate in the ball field, so we'd want to be able to, you know, say no on some of those. But uh, I, think, I think that's a good way to go. So has something changed about marketing? Are we, uh, at one time there was a public information person for Parks and Rec, right? Do we, and that is no longer there. I know the zoo has one. That, I mean, they're specialized in the city. So, And you mentioned at the very beginning that the city manager's PIO is doing Parks and Rec. And I don't know how that's changed over the last couple of years. And COVID is a deal breaker for everything. So I, I you know, I'm not trying to. For the, the last several years, we have had a community relations officer. It's been a position within the Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, we've had several individuals uh, filling that role during that time. But the, that person was responsible for media outreach, uh, graphic design, development of our activity guide, uh, design of posters and flyers and different, different things. Um, they help prepare presentations and schedule presentations with you know, rotary clubs and groups you know, for, for public outreach. Um, that position was open for a period of time. Um, and then it, it, we moved that position to under to report to the public information officer. Mm -hmm. uh, public, during the time that the position was open, uh, the public information officer provided some support mm -hmm. to us, but they were obviously providing support to the entire organization. And so we, we have now hired a marketing specialist. They, re, they work uh, with the PIO and they work primarily with Parks and Rec. Uh, so they attend our staff meetings and they, they hear what we're doing and, and develop strategies you know, to help promote our, oppor you know, our opportunities and offerings to the community. They've been on board since August 1st. Just, oh well, that's so short less. So just a couple of weeks um, okay. that, they, that they've been on board. So they're, mm -hmm. they're still getting to know us. And what they've been, a, uh, Lauren has been a big help in preparing, you know, fall uh, flyer, uh, fall program information, um, our uh, after school program information, uh, developing that, those materials and updating our website, getting that information out to the school district to share on our behalf. Thank you. Yep. Yep. What's, it's, it's, this is on the agenda for. Is that person solely tasked with Parks and Rec or are they split with other departments? Where are they housed? They're, they're housed in the communications division in the manager's office. And they, I would say that they are predominantly Parks and Rec, but I can't speak to 100% of their time. And does sponsorships fall into their responsibilities at all? I don't believe so. Uh, I might mention from the marketing standpoint, you know, I'm really talking about participation levels 
And probably one of the reasons that our participation levels have really fallen is because we did not do a very good job of marketing. We didn't get the word out to the community that we had these programs. And if we've got a person now that's charged with that, then we'll see, I'm, I'm sure, a turnaround. But for a period of time, uh, I think basically, and we talked in Parks and Rec meetings, uh, we, uh, we used Facebook. And that was about it. And that was easy, uh, but that doesn't cover the entire community and doesn't get the results you need. And obviously, we didn't get results. So we've got a, I think we have to uptick our marketing uh, abilities, strategies, work out strategies. You know, uh, marketing is a huge part. Ask the ad agencies in town, they'll tell you uh, that uh, in order to be successful, you have to have a good marketing plan. And we should uh, have that, keep that in mind when we're doing our programming. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's 10 to 8, and so we need to move on. Uh, the next is the status of programming, the elimination of, of programs. Um, who wants to speak to that? I think we talked about mm -hmm. getting a report, Sue uh, and getting a report of the programs that have been lost or abandoned, but if that's the right word. Um, <clears throat> we have discussed that in participation levels being down. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, the big one uh, under this, this uh, particular area is privatization. And uh, we've had mixed signals uh, coming back from uh, City Hall about privatization. And the public, uh, obviously, in our uh, forum, um, wasn't <coughs> seeing privatization as a good way to go. Um, so I think we need to discuss that with the city staff. Where are we going with privatization, and what does it mean, and how are we defining privatization? What I may think is privatization may be a whole different thing from city staff's interpretation. So we should get an indication from them where they're going with this. Is Boys and Girls Club privatizing? I mean, definition-wise, that's what you're saying, is clarify what it means. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I think the fear on the privatization concept was everybody thought we were going to traveling leagues. And, and I know that's not what the intent of the staff was. So, so the, you're right. The operational definition of what does privatization mean Making it private. What does that mean? What's the operational definition? And that's that's unclear. I think, uh, to me, it, it it was more of an idea of let's collaborate and and figure out how to, you know, combine resources. Like the idea of, uh, you know, partnering with the senior center. That's not making it private. That's you know expanding it. Or or if or if there are certain clubs out there like the the thing that was done with soccer that works, you know, great. But that's not forcing kids into traveling leagues. And, and I think that's what most people read when they when they saw that term used. They thought, "Oh, we're going to get rid of all sports, and it's all going to traveling leagues." And I and I do not believe that was the intent of the staff. Okay. Anybody so, else? So I, I do have a question with soccer, and maybe Wyatt can answer this. So when what it, so SKV and Poon have taken over the rec league of of what Parks and Rec used to do. What is the benefit of them doing that? I mean, why, why are they willing to take on another 100 kids at a, at a $50 level to do that basic rec league versus a lot of their emphasis is traveling? So that, that's a good, ex a good question and a good example of, of what I would call partnership where mm -hmm. we, I mean, they, in terms of, of the partnership, they, they reserve our facilities and they do offer recreation as well as travel programs. When that was negotiated several years ago, there was intense competition for the uh, turf Facilities. field at Annaberg. Mm -hmm. We had multiple clubs as mm -hmm. well as our leagues, mm -hmm. and we were trying to schedule all of those groups on top of one another. Mm -hmm. And so staff met with the, with the clubs and, and worked out an arrangement where they would be able to run their events on certain nights mm -hmm. and they would take the the rec league aspect into their programs at a similar cost and offer scholarship opportunities for kids and then that would work 
it worked best within their within scheduling that facility and scheduling the whole of Annenberg mm -hmm. uh, to to make that work rather than so then, our, our rather than our programs trying to compete for space. Typically, we sure. would give our our club or our programs priority on fields, and just as we work through the details of what schedules would look like, it made sense for them to take some of that over, and they were willing to do that. So they I, got discount on the on the on the on the fee of renting the. No, they pay the they pay the rate okay. our published rates for those fields. Okay. For their for rental and for practices and for games. Okay, it seems that a time when our participation level is going down, the participation level of the clubs is going up. Absolutely, is doubling. Absolutely. has doubled. I right. mean, so but, there's. But again, this we don't want to lose those kids that don't have yeah. the desire or the ability or the finances to do club. We want to keep the rec league, and that's wonderful that. Puma and SKV have taken over those those rec leagues. That's a great partnership. And you've worked those kind of situations with Manhattan Basketball Association, right? And those are kind of starting, they've taken over. I mean, one of the programs that you that you said is coming up is truly a three-on-three -three through MBA, right? Correct. The yeah. M M MBA offers competitive travel, but they also offer a variety of clinics and camps that they partner with us to use our facilities. They're open to the public to participate. You don't have to be a part of their traveling team to participate in those other rec type opportunities. Um, and, and there's and there's other examples of partnerships where we, uh, you know, partner with Paragon Performance Sports. For example, we advertise and re take registration for uh, ninja training and youth tumbling. Their staff and their and their facility offer that that program, um, and we split revenue for it we do we have a similar revenue split with with MBA uh, for the programs that they run that we help facilitate and you know in, in all of those cases I mean they are feeder programs into more competitive opportunities certainly you know Puma and SKV have an interest in getting kids into the rec league so they can then potentially if they're interested and have the skill advance um, beyond that and you know meet, meeting with Puma representatives today you know, they they talked about you know filling those higher the, the higher age groups in soccer is is difficult because you know youth at a certain point you know at age you know 12 or whatever are making decisions about whether they're going to continue to play that sport or they're developing other interests or they have an aptitude and then they're moving on to travel league opportunities and there's sponsorships and scholarships available within their programs for kids uh, to do that so, you know, as Sue mentioned, we have multiple uh, program offerings over the past five years that have that have been reduced and our participation numbers have reduced. And that and that is true. Big aspects of that are youth soccer and adult softball. And those are programs that we no longer offer, but that others in the community are offering. And so in 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 a lot of ways, Puma and SKV have more participation than than we did in terms of rec soccer opportunities and so i don't know that the participation opportunity is being lost through those partnerships it's it has shifted um, where we're not counting those numbers anymore whereas we we used to count them because they were our programs and our registrations so that's not to say that we couldn't do something different in the future and bring back those programs into our wheelhouse and staff those and offer those through parks and recreation but that's kind of the context of where we sit today and maybe how it relates to some of the, the other discussion about participation for you. And, and I would just add, I believe the partnerships is a, is a great way to go, but the city has to have some oversight as well. Because when, you know, adult softball is a great example of that, very little oversight and that league is basically collapsing. Uh, so we have to find partners but not wash our hands of it. We still have a responsibility to the public to offer these, these programs. So have, have a, an umbrella effect on them and let these partnerships operate them, uh, but you still have to be involved in them in, in some ways. Uh, otherwise, you have no control. It, it, it could actually you know, uh, eliminate some of these uh, sports because 
that uh, program that we partner with may collapse. And we have nothing to do with it, and we have no way to go, no direction to go at that time. So to, to say, hey, we're going to give up adult softball and let somebody else run it, and uh, good luck, is not the way the city ought to be operating. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that's exactly what I heard. I think what I, the duplicating of the programs is probably what we're going for, is not to have the same type of programs. But I wouldn't say, um, I think the presence of Parks and Rec is definitely there if they're using our fields and the need and the aspect is there. I'm sure, I don't know how you track all of that, but I think there is a tracking mechanism of what, who's using what and when and how often and, and their participation rates. And should something fall off the radar, I think that's when we have to evaluate, one, why, why is that sport going away and why do we need to pick it up if nobody wants it? I think that I think we need to keep up with the evolution of things, not just keep doing the same thing over and over again because that's what we've done over and over again. Good the point. Talents uh, are changing. And in our in our programming spreadsheet, it did not include participation numbers when these other clubs took them over, so we don't know. We have no idea how many participants are in the club sports. Right. Because For the recreation levels. Yeah. For the whole community, right. it's that we know only what the city uh, supports, mm -hmm. and so I, I guess the people who voted for the gyms, I think they thought that they would be open more to public access, and so when we start uh, closing them for certain periods for a special population, I uh, I want that to be. I, I don't know if the city is in the business of just providing the facility and somebody else runs it, or if we have a role in also providing programming there, and is that not our pri pri primary uh, purpose? Uh, the clubs you know, are making money or they would not be doing what they're doing, and that means the city is not making money uh, because we've we're transferring the uh, programs. I think we I, need to move on to this. I, yes. In my microphone. Sure. Yeah, please. May or may not work. Sounds like it is. Okay. Um, a, a couple quick things on this topic because it's one that concerns me a lot. One is um, soccer may be a, a successful model and has worked, and I've coached with Puma this past year, uh, and it was okay from my experience. I actually enjoyed Parks and Rec a little more. I thought it was better structured and the communication was better, but, um, but softball is a mess. And... Um, the amount of people who used to play adult softball in this community has dwindled to almost nothing because the, the competition, the, the folks that are playing are extremely competitive um, and there is not a place for less competitive teams, for your church teams or your teams from your, from your office or any of those things. There's not a place for that. The amount of alcohol consumption that's happening in the dugouts, those types of things that are really making it, in my opinion, not a very safe environment, especially when we have children sharing in the same area. Uh, we often have games of both that adult league and children's leagues in the, in the diamonds at the same time. Uh, so that's one that, personally, I, I've played in softball leagues in Manhattan for many, many years, and I really miss it. Um, I played in four games this year in this other league, and I did not enjoy it at all. Um, so I appreciate they're trying to offer something, but I don't think that's a successful example of, of this type of model. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is we also have to pay a close, close attention to the diluting of what our offerings are. Let me give you an example. My, I just signed my fifth, fifth grader up for volleyball. Last year she played volleyball. Uh, I think we paid $40 and we had seven games. There were two Parks and Rec staff present. There was an official and a scorekeeper. This year I paid $40 and we get four games and there's one official and parents are doing the scorekeeping. So we have diluted the product. You know how we talk about, um, you know, you go to the grocery store and a Snickers bar is more expensive and smaller than it used to be. So we have to be careful with that, I think, as well with our programs. And I know some of it's staffing related. I don't know if there's other factors that played into that. Um, but I was a little disappointed when I signed up my, my child for that, that she's only going to get to play four games. Um, if I'm reading everything correctly, I haven't seen a schedule yet. But uh, once that comes out, I'll double check. The last thing I wanted to mention, it connects to some possible partnerships as well as programming, and I know this was mentioned in the public forums, is the opportunity to look at eSports as a way to capture 
a different type of participant than we currently uh, have. And um, K-State is ramping up its esports program significantly right now. Um, and uh, it's definitely an arena that you can go to uh, to access kids differently. And so I know nothing about esports, so I'm no help. But um, I, I think it's an avenue uh, that we could look at to increase uh, the types of programs we're offering uh, to the community. In addition to, you know, as been mentioned in other comments, programming for other populations, you know, in our community also. Could you um, give us an update on the status of Seco Park? I know that it's on the agenda to be upgraded. It's part of that sales tax vote. So when and what will we see when? So we need to initiate the next steps in that. We have not at this point. Uh, our last uh, work on the Seco project was really prior to the sales tax vote in 2017. We've developed concepts for what that could look like. It involves a reconstruction of the baseball, softball fields, uh, and tennis courts, and you know, parking and other site improvements uh, there at the at the northeast and east side of of Seco. Uh, we would envision a process that involves uh, multiple meetings with the advisory board, the city commission, Riley County, USD 383, the public, um, to determine a, a final vision. You know, perhaps you know at your discretion, there you know maybe a steering committee similar to what led the rec center design process, uh, you know, looking for input as to how, how the details of those facilities come together and make sure that they meet the needs of the community. Um, I think we're anticipating uh, potentially starting some conversations, you know, later this year, um, and then, you know, some sort of process that we would need to still, to still determine in terms of hiring consultants, you know, is that a design bid build? process is that a design build or construction manager at risk process which is how we have built some other uh, facilities recently so there's some uh, some decisions to be made in terms of the method that we will utilize to design and construct these facilities but certainly we anticipate a lot of public input and input from from you all uh, as we initiate that process and we expect the funding to be there yes we okay. are we're collecting funds now through that sales tax and, and okay. banking those dollars to yep. prepare to pay pay in cash. We do have some other grants we've identified that may also supplement uh, some of the city funds for those uh, facilities. Okay. And there's one item here next on the 7th and ninth, seventh to ninth grade programming. And who wants to, Ed, that was well, on your, who, We touched who, on we that did earlier already. as well with, through okay. the middle schools. All so. right. So loss of staff and the plan to rebuild the staff. What is the vision? Ron, are you? Sure, I'll take that one. The, I think Wyatt did a great job of updating you where, you are, where the Parks and Rec yeah. Department is and filling uh, most of their vacancies. And that's, that's our goal is to rebuild and, and recharge uh, that we can build it back to, to where it's been before. And that's... Uh, the vision and that we're moving forward with so we will restaff parks and rec so that it can uh, we're not strangling it the issue with it now uh, is is staffing and not money so financing right now we're doing okay yeah, uh, at, at, the, at the same that. time uh, yeah. we did increase the budget for the parks and recreation department okay. uh, we haven't really increased the revenues uh, for that. So I think some of the same issues of, that we've always had will continue to be something and a challenge that we'll need to continue to meet. So the more that we can develop uh, additional sponsorships, additional uh, types of activities that will fund it uh, will be important. And you know, I know there's been a, you get tired of me saying this but you know we've, we've had this aspect of the if we look at the rec centers as an example which is a piece of the of the parks and rec department uh, which is massive um, when we asked the question the question was to build some gyms in conjunction with the school district the school district was going to operate those gyms 
throughout the school day and for their events. And then we were going to program the evenings when they weren't having activities in them, uh, and then the weekends. That was a fairly small budgetary amount uh, that we asked the community to support. Then when we, after it passed and time went on and we started to build the design process, we had a great steering and community input process. Well, why can't we have a better model? And so that better model was that the school district said, well, we really only need two gyms uh, for our use during, during most of the day. And so the architects became very uh, productive and had great input from the community. And we built what we have today that has a separator wall. And, and we now have a recreation center that we were only planning to staff a little bit in the evenings and on the weekends. And now we're at 12 to 14 hours a day every day. That's a huge cost. Um, and so that's something we'll continue. That cost is only going to go up uh, with utilities and everything else from a labor standpoint to staff it. So we'll continue to have those challenges. And so whether it's sponsorships and putting stuff on walls or activity participation fees of some kind, uh, that's going to be important. Um, and so we'll continue to have some of those uh, additional revenue challenges uh, at the same time you know we've just built a great exhibit at the at the zoo and we we have a, a zoo fee that goes to fund projects and education programs it doesn't do anything to offset the operating cost um, so those are some we made that this decision many a couple decades over two decades ago that we were going to start charging a fee to help improve exhibits not to offset the operating cost, which is, that's a good example if you go look at the past 20 years of what those costs have risen to be that the general fund supports. So, and that's been primarily through sales tax, which has been flat. So those are gonna continue to be our operational struggles. Uh, and, and doesn't mean we won't have periods of time where we're gonna say, departments, we need to squeeze down a little bit because the revenue isn't projected to come in to, to meet our expenses that we had forecast or budgeted for. You know, we, don't, other, we don't have an appropriations budget. Are other parts of Parks and Rec uh, also um, on lean funding? You know, right now we're doing pretty good and we're trying to fill those positions. Uh, you know, it's, 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 I'd say we're being able to fill more positions than we're losing, but it's been, it's a unique environment. Uh, everybody is feeling the pain of workforce uh, and the challenges. We have less folks in the workforce. And so you know, we have folks that get better offers to, to go other places. And so we have to refill. And so that's a continuing struggle. We don't have any purposeful uh, declines. Let me just answer it that way. We need more people to apply, right? Absolutely. We need to put ads out. <laughs> um, have we, is there more on this uh, segment? I, I just have one question that I missed my opportunity to interject earlier, but Mr. Fair bringing up the um, rec centers again, um, you had mentioned that there were some troublesome youth. <laughs> uh, as far as our policies and things are are kids being asked to leave like when they, when they are doing those sort of things can we you know let parents know like that's not acceptable and your child will be asked to leave and at that point you're responsible for them um can is there any i mean what's our policy on i don't know anything about the rec centers my kids are past that age but i um, just curious about that point so yes we have facility rules and we have a process where if if individuals youth or not anyone you know does not follow those rules there are consequences to that which could range from you know being asked to leave for the day uh, to being asked you know to being suspended for use for an extended period of time you know a, a week a month a year you know if if there's fights and rcpd is involved and you know those, those are severe consequences for endangering the situation there so yeah. so yes and, and we uh, we did implement those practices last year and had difficult conversations with students and their families uh, when those consequences ensued um, obviously our our goal is to provide a safe positive environment and we certainly want 
participants to follow those those rules and, and participate in a way that allows them to come back. Right, and that's for the whole community, not it just is. our youth. And so it is a public facility, so just being respectful to the general public is probably a good rule of thumb for all of us when we're there. So, Yes. Do you have cameras for the vandalism type stuff? Yes, we do have uh, security okay. cameras. Good. Okay. Sue? But of course, not in the elevators or the restroom, so that was part of the, part of the issue. And you are still scanning everyone in, right? I've, I've got one of those little red cards. Well, when, you, yes. when you go in the rec center, you get scanned in so you know who's been using it when. Yes, so, yeah, so everyone, either you can scan your card or you can give your name. If you're a regular, we probably know you, and we'll, we may punch you in as you walk by and say hello. Uh, but, yes, we are, we are tabulating those drop-in, walk-in users. Sue? Since we're back on rec centers, I had a question while Hannah's still here. Sorry. Um, the comments I've had from the public have been the walking track. The senior citizens, in the, especially as winter is coming about, wanting to use those uh, in the afternoons. And what I'm understanding with some of the citizenship and the homework and that, is there any way as we make modifications to this program, the walking track could be opened back up for that kind of activity? So any adults that would be in the facility do have to be uh, background checked, so volunteers or staff members have to be background checked. So I think it would probably affect. So even if they're not participating because you have a license, have to, but it's our city's recreation center, you're running a program, so, but it's really our center, so why is the license, I'm very confused. Yeah, so if it were to be Boys and Girls Club on especially that side of one and two, um, they cannot be separated off. Similar to three and four can be sectioned off, and that's what the school district uses. One and two cannot be, and so when we would be over on one and two with our licensure, all staff, any adult person that would come into contact or have access to a kid has to be background checked, whether that's in a volunteer or a staff capacity or just an adult. So the city knew that when they contracted with you that we wouldn't be ever be able to allow anyone else to ever yes, use it. Yes, Parks and Rec staff are being background checked. Okay. I got one more uh, question on the hiring process and uh, it was uh, come to light at least some people have stepped up and told me that our hiring process is very drawn out, takes a lot of time to get somebody on uh, board with the city and that's especially um, uh, difficulty for seasonal workers because if you're applying for a summer job and it takes you three weeks four weeks to get hired at the city you accept another job because you're only going to be working for a couple months or eight weeks or whatever it is for the summer is that true and if that's the case how can we streamline that to get seasonal workers uh, on board I'll just say that uh, our HR division which has been short staffed from time to time. Right now, I think they're down some staff, but they've worked with uh, the various supervisors to try and work on some better recruiting stuff. You know, I think uh, just as an example, uh, I look, I was worried that we weren't going to be able to open three, three pools this summer because I didn't think we'd be able to have uh, enough success in doing that, but uh, we were able to do that. So uh, I, th I think there's, uh, uh, certainly opportunities that uh, our staff have stepped up uh, both uh, in HR and other places but there is a lot of uh, background information that we need to have uh, for those types of events we have hiring fairs and different uh, types of episodes but we have situations where certain paperwork has to be put in place to before they can start work. And so those are continuing challenges to be able to do that. But I, I, th I have full faith in, in our HR staff to be able to work with our recreation supervisors uh, to get that staff hired. Well, I, I do know we have problems with seasonal workers and the numbers to hire. And if the HR process is part of that problem, we should at least scrutinize that process. So uh, I was going to say, um, 
I don't know, Tammy, if you can speak to this, uh, how the hiring process works. I certainly don't want to put you in the spot, but I do know there's sometimes um, it is probably a longer process, and even if they're if you're understaffed, just as uh, Hannah mentioned about background checks and working with youth and all of these things, and if you can just go through that part of how you hire somebody, even for a seasonal worker, would be very helpful so we can understand where the gaps are, what we can do better, uh, where you might need more assistance, or if it's working well, but we've just had a lot of people we couldn't hire for a variety of reasons. Sure. So. <clears throat> Sorry I had a drink in a little while, so my voice is a little froggy. <laughs> Um, so the way the process works is that rec supervisors, as they're coming up on a season, will post positions. As applications start coming in, they get a notification if they've signed up to receive that by email or directly through Paylocity every time they log in. They go to the, rec the recruiting module, review applications, rec supervisors, and this process hasn't changed for a while. Rec supervisors interview the people that they want to interview for the positions. When they make a determination that they're going to hire that person, they submit a request to the administrative team in Parks and Recreation to send out an onboarding plan to those recreational employees. The um, administrative team in Parks and Recreation then reaches out to those um, candidates directly through email in case they didn't get the notification from Paylocity so that they know they can log in and complete their onboarding. Um, I think that through all of this, it's been talked about there are 29 steps in that process. Nine of them are internal steps. Um, and we have people complete that process in as, li in as little as five minutes, and other people can take weeks to do it. Sydney Baker, who you all know is our rec recreation specialist for aquatics, hires about 150 or 200 people in like two months. So the process can take as little time as, no as it can, or it can take a long time. It does require supervisors to follow up with the candidates and make sure that they're working through the onboarding because there are so many people in onboarding at all times. Um, we generally have at least 100 people in onboarding, especially during times when recreation and aquatics are hiring. That, that module is very busy. Um, that's in addition to all the other positions that we're hiring across the organization. Anyone hiring, any hiring manager that's hiring is responsible for um, staying on top of that onboarding and making sure their candidates are working through that process and getting through it because there are supervisor steps along the way that need to be completed to make sure that they can get successfully onboarded. Once that's done and they've completed those steps, the Parks and Recreation Administrative Team emails those people and asks them to sign. Um, to send us three of their um, times that they're available to come in and fill out their um, I-9 document with their original I-9 documents, which is a requirement by federal law, and the oath of office, which is required by the state for all employees who are employees of a municipality. When we receive that email, we set up that appointment. Generally, at their first available time, they come in. <clears throat> Excuse me. They come in, they meet with HR, they fill out those documents. We click a button in Paylocity that allows that person to clock in. And as soon as it's done, they can start working. Yeah, thank you. What'd you say, Christine? <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. It, it, it can go really fast or it can take a long time. It just depends on the person. We do, the Parks and Recreation Administrative Team does a great job of supporting applicants if they're having issues along the way. Um, they're told in that email to contact them if they have any problems. We just have some people that respond really well to that process and some that don't. So it just kind of depends on the candidate once we've identified them to hire and then what the supervisor is doing to stay in contact with them and make sure that that gets done so that they can get the um, employees they need to run their programs. Thanks, Tim. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but I also when there was a background check thing came up. I also know that's something 
you have to do it because when they're working with children and such, that was just such a critical piece to this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's just so many steps involved and it's good to have that information as we discuss efficiencies and how to make things better and maybe how we can onboard folks better or whatever that is. Uh, and if you can bring those recommendations to us sometime or work within uh, our city administration, that'd be great. We've, I'm sure it just needs more We people. have constantly been in contact with Parks and Recreation and when we first started using Paylocity, we worked through, it was um, July 2020, we started using the onboarding module. It actually it was before that because we did a lot with aquatics that year. And we c continually improved that process as we worked with Sydney through her hiring process of 150 or 200 seasonals. And then when we got through that, we met with um, the recreation team and talked about it, trained them on it. We went through another hiring season and then asked for more feedback. We made changes, went through another hiring season, asked for feedback, made some more changes, and then we kind of settled. Um, so Human Resources is always willing to collaborate with the department and try to find ways to make that easier. But as Ron and Ron pointed out, there are some things that we have to have in order to be in compliance with laws, to have employees, and to make sure that they understand what we need while they're serving. One uh, question. Sounded like uh, the supervisors are pretty important in the stepwise to get the uh, approvals done. And if those positions, more than one, are vacant, what happens then? For seasonal employees? Well, yeah, uh, to, to fill those <clears throat> slots uh, of uh, checking all these applicants out, if the supervisor positions are vacant, who else picks up the slack in order to keep the process going? That, that'd be delegated to whomever is and there are picking other up the slack for the program that needs the employees. There are other people to be delegated to then? Or, or is that part of why we're ha having this whole Discussion. evaluation so uh, Tammy I can you may not be in the that. position to answer it or but anyhow yeah I don't Wyatt I don't or Ron maybe you want to step yeah. in on that so I, I can speak to how it's worked you know in the past couple of months as as we've been down staff mm -hmm. uh, you know we we had ex other existing recreation supervisors that were filling in multiple roles and they were managing hiring processes for programs that were not traditionally theirs. Um, our administrative team that, that Tammy spoke of, a key piece of that is Janelle Fritzen, who's our operations officer, and she has managed a lot of those hiring processes, both with full-time and with working with HR and, and Tammy specifically, as well as our, our seasonal staff. Um, now that you know we have more staff on board, I, I see that process going more smoothly uh, at least from from in terms of the steps that we participate in it does always get back to the applicants initiative to read their email and respond and and do their steps of the of the process but but yes we do place a high level of responsibility and accountability on those supervisors to hire the people that they need to manage the programs that they have planned welcome thank you um, I would just like to make a comment that I was happy that the pools were open the entire of the summer mm -hmm. all three of them were open that was a probably a real success given the shortage of the rest of the uh, parks and rec staff but uh, I'm glad we didn't have a crisis in the pools this year like we have in the past that was good news um, I'm going to move on to budget issues, um, and um, first one is transfer of funds to the general fund, so I assume that's parks and rec or sales tax or whatever money, I don't know, so I'm not sure. What I'm not the, sure what the what question the, is. What's the I issue? mean, I didn't author the page, so I don't, I'm not sure what yeah. the, uh, where the, tra the, the parks and rec budget is in the general fund. Okay. It's all in the general fund. It, so there is no transfer to be made. The, uh, but Ron, you have a certain budget amount for Parks and Rec, and some of those funds have been allocated elsewhere. Is that correct? No, I don't think that's true. Uh, I think we've, we've targeted 
each department to have a spending limit when the revenues aren't there. So we've squeezed those budgets and reduced them, but there hasn't been money there to transfer. So uh, part of that is to help support uh, a reserve fund. Now we've created some some new programs, but uh, going forward with the 23 budget, which the commissioner is aware of, uh, are some of our internal transfer funds, but uh, we haven't retargeted those funds. It was just trying to create savings within that department to build reserves in the general fund that could help parks and rec could help public works it could help anybody else so i guess if you were going to say there's a, a a transfer we're trying to beef up some of those reserves uh, to continue our operating costs yeah because those, those monies could be used elsewhere basically within the general fund. anybody in the general and any any department in the general fund yeah but yeah so you um, uh, the city came to the city commission and uh, I believe the park board asking for a sales tax uh, increase for parks and recreation. Um, uh, the intent was that uh, uh, it was not accepted by the city commission. Was um, What was the intent there? That came early. Tell me about that. Sure. So it was a... Uh recognition of uh, a way to try and provide some dedicated funding. One of the things we've talked about as uh, we have future projects is that we should look to part of the question that we answer folks to support would also include some operating and maintenance funds, not just construction funds, uh, so that there's a, a revenue mechanism there. And so the, the intent was to ask a question and put it on the ballot for a two-tenths sales tax that would specifically support Parks and Rec uh, as a revenue stream and not be subject to be able to be used somewhere else to help support the operations. We didn't, we wanted to get feedback uh, from the commission. Obviously there was the, the late timing of it was such that there's a deadline uh, in order to get something on the ballot for, for November. And so that was uh, that was the thought process, and and yes, it did come around very quick. But uh, obviously, the commission wasn't uh, uh, supportive of the concept, so we didn't pursue trying to define what it might or might not be. Okay. All right. Um, and then the next one is funds required to run the department, and. Uh, we just need just to operate, understand operating that. operating yes. funds. Yeah. Where is the department? We need to understand the, the total dollars needed to run the department. With all the things we've discussed tonight, what's it going to take to make this work? And I don't know if we can have that number tonight, mm -hmm. but certainly within budget building, we need to look at uh, how are we going to afford to make this Parks and Rec department run as we've, uh, as we've uh, pointed out tonight. And how? And, and basically, Ron, Ron you know, you said that Parks and Rec budget is all general fund. I, I get that, but there are two dedicated pieces. The, the special alcohol tax puts a third of that goes to Parks and Rec, is my understanding. So that's dedicated to it. And then the quality of life sales tax that's been passed, of course, that's dedicated now to finishing SECO and whatever. That's and in the long term, I'd like to see that renewed, but with the caveat that the money could be spent on operations. And that won't be for a couple of years, but uh, that's one of the reasons I didn't want to see a, another sales tax on top of it for Parks and Rec. I think we have the opportunity to renew that in the future. But but I think what Ed and the Parks and Rec Board like to see is maybe, okay, here's what we're getting, special alcohol money. Here's where this is coming in. And then this is the mill levy portion of it, essentially property tax. And And, you know, what's the case for raising that? And I'm never a fan of raising the mill levy, but you know, here's a case where can a case be made to say that there's not enough there to run parks and rec, and the citizens want to run parks and rec, and therefore we need to raise property tax, which uh, Jason would like that comment. But uh, but you know if that's what it's going to take, fine. I mean that's that, that's really the definitive answer. And if you don't do it, then sorry, you know here's the programs we can't run, but we got to reduce hours. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a good summation. Uh, you know, right? Really, there are no property taxes going to. If we were to assign the the mill levy in the general fund, and you asked me to do that, it would fund half the fire department. 
because that's probably the most critical organization in the general fund. And that's, that's all of the property tax levy in the general fund would fund. Um, the, the special funds, traditionally, we've used the special park and rec fund uh, for CIP items. We've used it for projects. We have, um, to my knowledge, I don't think we've ever used it for funding people. Okay. With that, I think we're growing weary. <laughs> uh, but there's still an opportunity. Uh, I, I hope that we're still interested in public comment. So, um, with uh, and, uh, now that we pretty much exhausted everything <laughs> we as, uh, wanted to say, uh, so the next, I think until 9 o'clock, uh, if it goes that long, I'd like to switch to a, a public comment period. So anyone that would like to speak, if you'd come forward. This has been a topic that we have heard a lot, we have heard from the public in emails mostly uh, to the, through the city's website. And uh, it's, it's hard to read an email and say, and and know exactly um, what's happening, and uh, there's then then you talk to the city person administrator responsible, and you know it, it's hard to pick our way through it uh, and know just what's the right next thing to do. So um, if you have something you'd like to contribute, please come forward. Welcome, Bruce. Mayor, members of the Commission and the Parks and Rec Board. Uh, my name is Bruce McMillan. I served on the Parks and Rec Advisory Board for many years, chaired it as well. And throughout that entire experience, I learned the immense broad range of responsibilities that this department has. It is overwhelming in my experience. The things that you're dealing with this evening are beyond the things that we dealt with over the years that I served. Uh, I commend all of you for your in-depth understanding, your tenacity in wanting to correct and put this department back together again. And I hope that the public that may be listening and may not be listening uh, understands the dilemmas and the challenges, but that this city administration, in my experience, and I'm only speaking for myself, has done a remarkable job dealing with the shortages, the staffing issues, and the uh, ongoing challenges of running a city government, and particularly this department. The department, in my, I, wor I have worked with four different Parks and Recreation directors over the years. Professionally, I have worked with the department since 1982. That's 40 years. I've worked through several bond issue efforts with this department as well. Ed and I and others on the board have worked through those same bond issues over the years. I don't have the answers, obviously, but I, th I think through your tenacity, your interest, and your support, of the city and this department, we can work it out together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak? Please come forward. It's a big department. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks. I, uh -huh. My name is Shelley Buchanan. My husband has worked for Parks and Rec for, since he was probably 15, and um, we've been very involved in the community and with the Park and Reaction programs. I think watching it deteriorate over these past years have been really hard on Mike, especially, and, um, and me listening to him. Part of the problem is, is 
not everything is being revealed. You know, you have to ask yourself, why are nine employees out of the 12 Parks and Rec gone? It was because of the toxic environment that was created by the upper management on those staff members, especially the supervisors, and the way that they were treated, which was wrong. Um, as far as the hiring process goes, each year those same people have to reapply again. So if they were hired to be for just aquatics and then they stop working for the year, then they have to reapply again. That's part of the hiring project or process there. And then also, with HR being short-staffed, they still have to make an appointment with them to finish the on onboarding, which the supervisors can do all, the whole thing within an hour. It shouldn't take three weeks. Um, the fact that they said that they left the supervisors for a higher paying position is not true. Most of them left for less paying positions or no position at all. So we kind of need to look a little bit deeper of why these people left. So thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to come forward? Okay, seeing no one, I will close the public uh, comment period. Is there anything else that we need to do or know before uh, we have a motion to adjourn? I would just like to go back to Wyatt and Ron's beginning about building this comprehensive master strategic plan. I mean, we have so many arms going here about this problem, that problem, and programming. But if we really look at the mission, the programs, the facilities, the cost recovery, all those things together, I think we have to go forward with a good comprehensive strategic plan that gets public input. How we get that public input, not another forum, you know, there's other ways, but to me that's got to be the, the, a, a, a strong future direction for us is to have that plan in front of us that says this is where we're going. And I think that was uh, what we committed to at the beginning of this year. Uh, and if we're not careful, it's going to slip a lot, slip away and we aren't going to get it done this year. So um, question is, <clears throat> um, how quickly can we get it done or get, uh, what, if we were to start today, when would it, uh, could we have it, would we have it in time for next summer? Would it be uh, spring? How long does this study take? Well, I think we have to define the study first. Yeah, I know. Um, and, it, and it's pretty broad, so it's something that uh, I think we would want uh, a lot of uh, discussion on, developing that, that scope. Uh, our goal, at least initially, and, and when we made that goal at the beginning of the year, we were, had a lot more staff. So right now we're looking at trying to rebuild and stabilize uh, before we take on a big task because Wyatt's wearing several hats, several folks are wearing several hats, and so we'd like focus, folks to be on board and in a position to where single hats are being made. That's rare in the organization, but, and we may not find that. But I do think it's something we need to keep in front of us uh, so that we can, we can better define and then establish uh, uh, that scope and that process and a timeline for it. So I think it will take uh, several months and a number of different uh, types of engagement that will make it more successful. Uh, by the time you go out for an RFP and get proposals, I mean, it's I don't think we can do it in time to really affect 23 programs. If that's yeah. what you're getting at, I think it would be a this calls for a longer whole, term. holistic evaluation of all parks and rec facilities, including missions, programs, activities, fees, and cost recovery models. The evaluation should consider community priorities and how they may impact existing services, park master plans, staffing, and fees. Um, 
I mean, one of the topics that we've talked about with fees is whether to charge people from uh, out of the city an additional charge because they aren't contributing to the costs of the city programs uh, with property taxes. I guess they are sales taxes probably. I mean, that's one of the extreme things that, that's been bandied around ever since I've, I think, since I've lived in Manhattan, and I don't think we've ever charged it, and we probably wouldn't again. You can't, I, I just view it as kind of a divisive, um, something that's device, that would divide uh, the community, because our community is bigger. It, it's, you know, we, we think regionally, we think about the whole of the community, so... I'm, you know, I'd have to really think about that one before I'd support that. But there are others who may have other thoughts, especially when it comes to paying for some of this. And um, so, I, uh, I don't. There's, in other words, there's nothing that's going to be accomplished with regard to this, I strategic plan item, in the next year. Well, I think within a year, well, yes, uh, not, you said not not within the rest of this in, year. Not in 2023, so. Well, I'd, I think it would be hard to have a completed plan that would influence what we might do in 23. But as Wyatt said in his presentation, that's part of the focus and the analysis that's ongoing with uh, looking at the various programs and how we can, the partnerships, continuing partnerships that we can develop uh, to build that 23 program list and obviously uh, those will vary by season and so as you we do something that's comprehensive with it I mean we Jared with nine months on our overall strategic plan yeah yeah it took uh, about 10 months ten, yeah. 10 months so I mean it's a, the entire season. it's almost a year-long process mm -hmm. in and of yeah. itself so uh, you know, I would hope, uh, you know, by this time next year, we'd be talking about, you know, what are those implementation aspects for a new strategic plan for parks and recreation. Okay. So and that answers that? your question. Is there any piece of this that is a higher priority than another that we don't want to wait a year for? Maybe that's a question. I don't have any. I, I would think what we talked about with the advertising, like the sign things, we should go for that for the sponsorships we should go with that and set some goals and get that going i don't think you know we need to really wait around for that part i think uh with a new supervisor uh, being on board and bringing that experience um superintendent sorry uh would be very helpful i think since he's just now came on board i think there's probably lots of ideas there and now you've been part of this listen listening piece and to have as more people are hired, I think, I think uh, it's been made clear about sponsorships, marketing, um, recruitment, and just marketing not only in the sense of sponsors, but how to get people to know about our programs, partnering with USD 383. So I think some of those things that you bring to the table would be very effective, and maybe to reevaluate in three to six months again and see where we are with all of that, and uh, whatever processes you can bring forward as far as um, a marketing person or a sponsorship person that's delegated those duties. I don't know what that looks like, but I think we are, we probably did this before and we just need to bring it back, uh, revitalize it and add more components to it. So it's a little bit more revenue, um, more of a revenue for us than prohibiting as far as cutting programs and such. And I would, I'd make a request from the Parks and Rec Advisory Board standpoint that this is a roadmap, and let's add some more content to our meetings, and let's see where progress is being made, because you don't need a strategic plan to do some of these things. Uh, this is just general operations, and uh, so let's have some of that content in our Parks and Rec Advisory Board meetings, and let uh, the, the Advisory Board then pass that on to the City Commission as far as where we uh, where we see things going and approve, disapprove, uh, agree, whatever. But let's add some content to those meetings. I think it would be important for the Parks and Rec Board not to find out about a contract with Boys and Girls Club after it's already signed. 
I mean, their role is to advise. <laughs> and, uh, and like w when the pools are going to be closed or ju there's just an announcement, I think we need to know, uh, have some advance uh, information. Okay. The, uh, the first step, though, would be the, for the commission to address the bylaws for the committee, because as stated, we have to receive them from you with a recommendation. Okay. I mean, that's so what the we want it to say. What we want our role to be is that. I'm just want to. You've make been sure wrestling we're with it. <laughs> we should. Okay. We should bring that back to our next yeah. park board meeting and have a discussion on uh, uh, what everybody feels should be the uh, intent. And uh, then we can we can whittle that down. I think that's the proper way. If that's the case, I would request that we also get copies of the bylaws of the other advisory boards, because I think there needs to be consistency amongst those. I think that the that's what the city administration, the city attorney, is um, um, trying to. Uh, Ron, why don't you talk about what you're doing? So because. We can certainly uh, provide some guidance, but we need to have that conversation with the commission first, with your direction as to where you want to go with things. I mean, we haven't, we haven't, I mean, we Mayor, haven't you've indicated that the boards are having these discussions. They're yeah. not being initiated by the staff. Well, they aren't uh, coming to the commission, and I mean, we haven't. But, seen but they're any. looking for direction from the commission. We haven't seen any of them. And so that's that. We started that off with the memo that, that we provided to the commission. Yeah. We've scheduled your meeting in September for a work session mm -hmm. uh, for that to be taken up. And so I think that's what we'll be looking for, uh, the commission's uh, desire to have feedback on some of the proposals. Uh, there were some uh, consolidation efforts. I don't think there was anything specific, you know, and you've got all kinds of boards. You've got statutory boards that have clear authorities to do things, and then you've got a whole bunch of advisory boards and committees. And so, uh, and and you know as, as mayor, and there's other past mayors up there <laughs> about the recruiting challenges for, for those positions. So, but I don't think there's anything wrong in, in necessarily asking some of the board members for their advice on you know what they'd like to be involved with I mean right now there's a clear separation between policy and advisory and so you know I, I do think it's good that we pro should be asking more of your feedback on various issues that relate to uh, policies and not necessarily you know operations but that's that's a debate and discussion we can have What's another meeting until 9 o'clock? Um, just a quick <laughs> question to Wyatt and Ron. I know you were involved earlier in your life. You have a statewide organization of Parks and Recs, and you have conferences and meetings. You share your documents. Are there other departments that would share their bylaws of what their Parks and Rec are? I mean, maybe our new superintendent can bring in Salinas and Topekas. I mean, there's stuff to start with. And so when I shared last deal. month's meeting, I asked our folks to bring a couple suggestions. So I think we'll we'll have that as Ed will okay. sure we'll carry that forward as a big item next time, right, Ed? Yes. Yes. It's just hard to in if you don't have to invent the wheel and you can get an idea from some other uh, communities bylaws. I that seems reasonable. Um, I think we're ready to adjourn unless there's a, additional information for the city commission's purposes. Is there a motion to adjourn? Mayor, I move we adjourn. I'll second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. Jared, would you call the roll? Commissioner Butler. Yes. Commissioner Reddy. Yes. Commissioner Mata. Yes. Mayor Morris. Yes. Commissioner Hattisall. Yes. Okay. Do you Motion. have to do We're that? adjourned. I don't believe so. Okay. That that is a that's that's Parks and Rec still gets to just adjourn. <laughs>